can it's here. Can you hear us? Yes. Okay, okay, sorry. Um, yeah. I want to introduce you. Um, and we we are going to start with our with our session. So please you can start when you want. Let me know when I can start, okay? Right now. Now? Okay. Uh, good morning, or well, it's a good afternoon to you and a good, uh, a good day for everybody. Thank you so much for organizing this conference in such a challenging time. Uh, we had one uh, here uh, a few weeks ago and it was uh, interesting too <laughs> and challenging as well. So thank you very much. Um, my... Um, uh, my work as a curator of the Burma Art Collection at Northern Illinois University. Um, let me, oops, I think I have issue with, oh yeah. Um, has been based on uh, various instruments. I have been uh, uh, doing some field work for the last 10 years in Burma, but today I'm presenting and withdraw from a research of a number of ethnomusicologists who work from a music point of view and uh, as well as uh, uh, newly digitized documents from the uh, British libraries, as well as uh, some of the documents we have here at NIU. So among the rich tradition of musical instruments found in Burmese culture, the Burmese harp, Sangok, has become a visual element of Burmese identity. This paper will explore its visual representation through history and its connection with other harp traditions. Uh, the musical instruments in the Burma art collection are uh, quite a few. We did organize in 2014 a special exhibition on music for the divine, uh, which uh, connected to all to Buddhism. And uh, this, uh, this uh, fall, we have another exhibition which uh, uh, targeted uh, to the ethnic groups. Uh, this is why we have such a uh, uh, collection. Uh, the Center for Burma Studies was created in 1986 and uh, is based essentially from um, a donation of uh, dip diplomats, um, travelers, scholars, missionaries, who have been living in Burma. This is a mission and uh, we accept this donation in function of their life in Burma at a certain time. Uh, well known in Asia, particularly in Burma, from the first millennium under the ancient Pew culture and celebrated by the Chinese under the Tang dynasty, the Burmese harp's popularity continue even now. Once a famous Asian instrument from China to Southeast Asia, it's nowadays solely played in Burma. And this representation is the actual <clears throat> type of Burmese harp. But as we are going to see, it has been evolving and changing according to the history and the location. There is a conundrum in Burmese. It lies not on the ground, yet it is no bird. Taken to the bosom, yet no suckling. Birded, but no sultan. This is a Burmese harp. Uh, you have here a few representations which are uh, adorning the Buddhist temples in Burma from the 12th century until the 19th century. Uh, my plan will go uh, from the historical point of view to a more uh, details of uh, associated with Buddhism essentially, but also with the spirit cult. And I will end it with few um, of the instrument we have uh, in our collection, uh, particularly the Karen. Um, so for those who don't exactly know where is uh, Burma and the link with the rest of Southeast Asia, uh, India is on the west side, China is on the north. <coughs> And this explains how tradition has been circulating. Uh, the Pew culture was at the center of what is Burma now. 
and you can see the, oh, the cradle of the Burmese civilization starting in the 11th century was in Pagan. And it moved from different capitals up north during the 16th to the 19th century. Um, let me first to introduce to the harp for those who don't quite know the uh, Burmese harp Samgok. It's an arch um, harp. And you can see here, according to the research of uh, Judith Baker, um, she retraced the origin from the Sumerian harp in 3200 BCE. Highly decorative, uh, the uh, arch harp formerly associated with the Buddhist dynasty that ruled uh, Burma for centuries, it is now the national instrument of Myanmar. Uh, similar uh, harp as we are going to see uh, are uh, visible still today in Burmese iconography dating back to the 8th century. It is made on a specific wood, uh, the paddock, uh, rosewood from the mahogany family, is uh, forming the bottom or the hollow body um, a part of the um, of the heart uh, of the harp. Uh, it has elements such as a body leaf at the final, which is associated with the tree under which the Buddha got the enlightenment. Uh, the uh, arch uh, came from the natural curved root uh, of the Sha tree, which typically grows in this shape on a hillside. And they can be up to 16 silk strings attached to the neck um, uh, and uh, within hand twisted uh, three ply red cotton turning cords. So you see here, I call the, this is tied together with the strings uh, which are attached to, um, uh, to the lower part. According to the, um, uh, to the various chronicle and particularly the Indian literature, we know the harp was associated to the indoor court performance. Its iconography could be found from the second to the sixth century, particularly during the Gupta period, which ruled uh, part of India during the fifth century and was uh, promoting Buddhism as a state religion. Uh, if you look at in the other side of Burma, uh, toward Vietnam, Cambodia, the ethnomusicologist Kersale, a French musicologist working on in Cambodia, looking at the roots of the Khmer instrument or the Cambodian instrument, he did look uh, in Vietnam, Laos, and also looked at uh, Burma as the sources of the origin for the uh, uh, instrument during the uh, Cambodian period or the Angkorian period, and I'm talking about 9th, 14th century. And so he, um, he identified amongst the old capital of the Cham culture in central Vietnam, in Misson, uh, this um, a representation with an arch, uh, which is not typical of uh, the tradition we'll found in Cambodia later on. And so in the old uh, pre-Angkorian, meaning before Angkor, which was the capital from the 9th to the 14th century, uh, in Sambor Prekuk, he found some lintels with um, this, arch, uh, this arch harp. We found also one in uh, a museum in Paxé, uh, which I uh, which I visited and worked uh, for a few years. Um, you see here the harp uh, in different type of lintel uh, from the sixth to the seventh century. Later on, uh, the Khmer iconography from the twelfth century uh, associated the harp with various other instruments at the court, but is not only associated with Buddhist uh, practice, but also from Hindu practices and rituals. 
um, uh, such as witnesses by the temple from Bante Shma and Bante Samre, as well as the Bayon. And you can see there are various type of temple dedicated to either Hinduism or Buddhism. Uh, contrary to the uh, Burmese harp, it's a very uh, large harp sitting on the floor, contrary to the one in Burma, which is always um, hold on the lap of the player. Uh, this is a series, and you see here an orchestra uh, playing for uh, the court in the 12th century. In um, for Burma, we got uh, various interesting sources uh, from the uh, from Chinese chronicle under the Tang Dynasty in 802. Uh, we knew that they were a group of 32 uh, musicians musician who came and they described the harp uh, being um, uh, having 14 strings and uh, being an arch type uh, with a phoenix at the end. Uh, we have another uh, reference in 05 uh, in a new tongue uh, history associated with another ethnic group, not the Pew, but the Moon living in the southern part of Burma. And uh, in 1961, uh, uh, the Tangui Yao, I'm so sorry, I speak Burmese, but not Chinese. <laughs> so the Mon music uh, is described. Um, the Mon music and dancing are the same at the Pew. They cultivate this talent from music. So you see this representation uh, of two type, um, which can really illustrate this double tradition from Southeast Asia and India. Um, uh, this is in Pagan, which was the capital, as I mentioned, from the, uh, from the 11th to the 13th century, and is usually associated with representation of uh, Buddha. Uh, this is only the cartouche which is under the Buddha. You see here in the 7th century, this harp, uh, which the design is represented here. Uh, Pagan, uh, at the center of the country uh, is made of more than 2,500 temples. And you can see here how the harp was represented, associated all along with, um, with Buddhism and Buddhist uh, representation of life of Buddha or life, previous lives of uh, Buddha. And it was uh, said in the chronicle that it was played by the monks at that time. So here are just few images I pass on just to give you the sense of the different type um, uh, of harp found uh, during that period in Pagan, which withdrew from the two other uh, tradition, India in the West and Southeast Asia in the East. Uh, if we continue the historical um, uh, research of how uh, harp, harp has been represented, uh, we found something close to the Chinese description in the chronicle uh, of uh, uh, 802 uh, of 805 with the phoenix. And this is a representation within a libra Buddhist library called um, Pitakataik. And um, uh, this, you see a lover with a representation of the uh, phoenix harp uh, with the ending of a phoenix. The artists are not necessarily musicians. The number of strings on the harp may not represent the reality underlying uh, Kersale uh, when we were talking about the number of strings. Um, the harp. Uh, later on, this is the uh, uh, 18th and 19th century, uh, is really associated with the life of the future Buddha or the Buddha himself. And normally, according to the Buddhist text, it should be only three strings uh, showing that the middle way for the Buddha to pursue. If your strings is too tight, it breaks, and if it's too loose, no sounds are coming. And so the middle way will be the just tension. 
uh, it associated also with the celestial musician uh, for the pleasure of the song of the of the harp, which is close to for the Buddha, according to his text uh, and his words, uh, close to the the word of the sangha. You have representation in different form, different support. In the 19th century, they continue to represent the harp associated with the Buddhas we saw. This is a manuscript called Kamawaza, which is from the 19th century. This is withdrawn from the newly digitized um, manuscript from the British Library. So you see associated with different events of, of the Buddha. Uh, what I would like you to notice at that time, it in the early manuscript and uh, um, in the uh, particularly in the manuscript tradition, it's when it's associated with uh, Buddha, it's gold. Um, in the caves in the northern uh, Burma, you see uh, you still see the phoenix represented facing. Uh, a, a series of Buddha images uh, with what we call in the text the Beluva harp. Oops, sorry. Uh, in a different configuration, here you still have uh, Banchula, and uh, this is uh, in the middle of previous uh, lives of Buddha represented unregistered. I don't go into details, it's just to show you. This is a very interesting, it's a 18th century, uh, early 19th century. It, it started in 18th century and continued in 19th century in the cave 478. Um, and you see the phoenix uh, harp here. Uh, the Beluva harp, and it's located at each corner of this ceiling uh, with no inscription atta attached. If we looked at the uh, inscription of this period during the 18th, 19th century representation, illustrating the previous lives of Buddha, uh, we see in permanence the celebration of the harp and um, of different form, uh, always celebrating the words of the Buddha. Uh, this um, in the same ceiling of the same cave, what is interesting is the moon harp, which is in form of a crocodile mijong. And this harp was still uh, visible and known by the artists in the 19th century. Uh, today, uh, the shape is a little bit different and uh, uh, it, has, it has pegs according to the Chinese chronicles. Um, in the 19th century, we see appearing these uh, red, black and gold, which was typical of the color of the court, but it's appearing only in 19th century. And this is just to give you a kind of view of representation of this mural representing here the Buddha resting and enjoying the celestial Panchasika playing the harp. Uh, in Thailand, in Northern Thailand, uh, which was influenced by the um, uh, Burmese tradition, you see the, um, the representation of the harp as it is played at the court. Uh, so in Thailand, we can think there was a tradition which was cross-border. Um, for example, the illustration of Ramayana, uh, influenced by the Thai version of the great Indian epic, the Ramayana, uh, is representing here with this Burmese version on uh, uh, various slabs and small stela with the harp as we know now. Um, although it's not very clear if the end has a body tree leaf or uh, just a phoenix. Uh, the harp in the previous life of uh, Fulcher Buddha, as I mentioned, was essentially uh, associated with various scenes of the court. Here you have the prince Siddhartha before he became a Buddha, and you see it plays either by woman or uh, by men. 
and uh, the harp is always representing in uh, gold. I'm not going into detail of that. Uh, you have interesting scenes when women are playing the, uh, the harp in certain previous lives of Buddha. Um, and uh, uh, here you, you have the representation of the harp, which is a, a very, uh, not contemporary, but late 19, early 20th century, when the harp really appeared as it is now. So we see this tradition emerging at the harp we know now from the end of the, uh, the 18th century, beginning of 19th century, and uh, as represented in the, uh, in the manuscript. This uh, late uh, manuscript tradition highly influenced by uh, the um, by the European is from um, late 19th, early 20th century. And we see the harp here uh, illustrating a very int uh, interesting story of a prince who became uh, in love of the queen, which has been kidnapped by a, a rival and who he's going to be in love with the queen. Uh, this is interesting because you have the same kind of history uh, from the spirits, uh, which is represented here. The sound of the harp with the player was so beautiful, it, it attracted the uh, spirit of the water and, uh, and uh, the prince had to stay under the water. Can you hear me? We are uh, running out of time. Please okay, please. so I'm just an, an, uh, ending now. Uh, you see this here in 1897, the representation of two traditions mentioned in the chroni in Chinese Chronicle. And that's it. Okay. And the Karen harp played by the group represented here is still uh, an interesting uh, tradition, which is still um, uh, visible today. And we have one example in our collection. Thank you. It was a very interesting presentation with amazing images. Uh, I'm opening. Uh, I'm opening now uh, our questions, remarks. Anyone? No. I have two things. Um, please, I would like to ask you why you consider the more heart uh, like a heart. It means uh, organological to me. It seems like more like a psaltery. No. Because mm. no. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's uh, the for me. Is it? It is not really the harp we know as the uh, national uh, elements, but it's part of the diversity of the harps you find in Burma. The other question I have: I saw on your uh, CV that you are the curate, the curator of this art collection, and I want to know. Uh, this is a little bit out of your presentation, but just a, a, a curiosity. A little bit more about your strategies for curate, curating this collection and how is the art considered by you in all the objects? Uh, there are two answers. Uh, we have a small collection of musical instruments. It's 15 out of 3,500 objects. We just moved in the new storage uh, this summer. Uh, this collection is only done by bequest and donation. Mm -hmm. um, so we, uh, we are extremely careful. First of all, our mission is to collect um, documents and uh, objects which uh, have been uh, a kind of witness of the life of American in Burma. So I'm extremely uh, careful about what I, um, I accept or not. Uh, this is, <laughs> I repatriate a Buddha um, 
few years ago and it was a, a kind of ordeal. It was very difficult. Um, it was not a Buddha belonging to us. It was a Buddha we identified as stolen Buddha, but it took a long time to, uh, to repatriate. Uh, the strategy uh, of the way I view the collection and my research, I was, um, I was in Burma uh, studying for my PhD and I learned the harp. So this is my interest is a long standing, uh, a long standing love for this instrument uh, because it was the most uh, Burmese one. And as I was learning uh, ancient Burmese, I, I wanted to, to connect with the traditional uh, musical uh, musical tradition and the harp became really one of the uh, more important instrument for me. And uh, I research on mural paintings because this is where you can retrace with the chronicles the uh, a lot of instruments which may have disappeared, such as the phoenix head, it disappeared completely um, after the 19th century. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you My for pleasure. And I would like to move to the next presentation by Zdravko Vlasekovic. Um, Sorry, Anton, do you have a question? <coughs> no, 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 okay. okay. <laughs> I will send around the uh, pictures that I'm talking about. You will see them on the slides, but they are, they are kind of nice to see them uh, close and personal. Uh, thank you. Uh, as you see on the slide, this paper, uh, I have. Uh, worked on with my colleague Wu Jian because uh, there is a lot of uh, Chinese in it and without him I would be uh, helpless because I cannot read Chinese. I can only look Chinese pictures. <laughs> uh, as voyage to China was for the 18th century Europeans long adventures and dangers but you were able to gain a first-hand experience of the faraway uh, lands. Chinese language was difficult to learn, and native speakers who could tutor it were extremely rare in Europe. And yet, the Chinese culture was intriguing and curious. The important, uh, imported silk, lacquer, and porcelain were everywhere highly appreciated, and the Chinese visual models, models were the desired objects to copy. China was a mysterious, exotic land, hard to penetrate, but truly appreciated for its sophistication. In 18th century places of European uh, nobility, uh, one room was often reserved for the important Chinese or Japanese porcelain. And it was not rare that a palace garden included the pavilion des designated in the uh, 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 Chinese style. Uh, um, the imported blue porcelain was commonly used in many types of middle class houses since the early 17th century, and yet Europeans knew little about Chinese daily life and culture, and there were not many collectors interested to assemble objects commonly used in China. And I'm uh, aware that here in Portugal there is there might be a little different situation. I'm mainly talking about change the Central Europe, uh, you know, from uh, the Netherlands down to, to France and uh, Germany. A few years ago, I published an article about European collectors of Chinese musical instruments before the end of the 18th century. My list was short. I was able to trace only eight collectors and two musicians who were roaming uh, Europe. 
Among them was the Dutch antiquarian and proto sinologist Jean Theodor Rohr, who has never visited China, but dedicated about 15 years of his life to study the Chinese language, history, and culture. In his collection, Rohr had a large number of high quality porcelain pieces, but he also collected objects documenting other aspects of Chinese life, and it included artworks, paintings, lacquer, male and female clothing, including underclothes. Apparently, he used to go to the port and ask sailors for, for pieces of clothes so he can include it in, in his collection. He, he owned a collection of uh, household implements, a whole Chinese apothecary with some four, uh, 500 ingredients, medical ingredients. Uh, and so he was he was very interested in collecting everything what what he he can he can do. He even even decorated his his room with the original Chinese wall painting. Um, at the first look, it might seem surprising that in such an extensive and varied collection of Chinese objects of all kinds. There were only a few musical instruments of very marginal form. It included one drum with the belonging stick, another pair of drums with the belonging drumsticks, a pipa, a flute dizzy, a shank, which was actually a Japanese <coughs> shaw, and a pair of bu cymbals. However, he also owned a set of 15 large scale scroll, uh, scroll paintings imported from China, representing a total of some 90 instruments, which are today in Museum Welterkunde in Leiden. And these are the pictures that I sent you around. Um, Jean Theodore was born in The Hague in 1737, and he lived they are making his living as a secretary and later also as deputy register at the Hof van Holland, Zeeland, and West Friesland. The two positions allowed him a good income and prestige in the highly, highest intellectual and political circles of the town. Aside from his duties at the court, he was an engaged antiquarian interested in Dutch national history, collecting prints and drawings. His antiquarian interest started from Realia, which he carefully studied and documented. During the, 19, the early 1770s, archaeological explorations were made in the graves of Hofkapel uh, on the Binnenhof in The Hague, where Roy was involved with examining the excavated objects and making their detailed drawings. And he owned a collection of about 21,000 prints and 800 drawings. And prints were divided into two groups. One group had uh, about 5,000 portraits of historical figures, and uh, the other were copies of uh, artworks. His most intriguing interest was the Chinese culture and collecting the Chinese object that occupied him during the period between about 1765 and 1780. His Chinese studies and interest in Chinese realia likely originated from his linguistic interests. And here, this is important. He knew Latin and Greek from a very early age. Later, he studied Hebrew, Arabic and other Oriental languages, and in the early 1770s, he started studying Chinese. He started learning Chinese from the European books about China that were available to him, but then he made contact with Carlos Wang, a trader and translator engaged with, uh, with Dutch East India Company in Canton. And he gave him in uh, the year 1773-76 about a corresponding course uh, by sending him a list of Chinese characters and with the pronunciation. And also he translated a Chinese text for for Royer. And eventually he, he was sending him Chinese children's books 
So he was learning Chinese from Chinese <laughs> Um And he, he had also uh, an encounter with another Chinese uh, servant who was in, in at the time in, in uh, Rotterdam, Tanner and Tan Asoy, but that is irrelevant in our story. Roy started, uh, started studying the Chinese language presumably uh, with the uh, intention to compile a Chinese dictionary. A such dictionary was not uh, existed at that time. In, in, uh, it was not available to him and it was not available in France, in Germany. Uh, I know in Portugal there were some Chinese dictionaries from before, but how do you know that? Uh, by the late 1770s, proto-Sinology in Europe has advanced and information about China and its language became, became more available. So uh, somehow in, in uh, the late 1770s, he obtained a manuscript of one Chinese dictionary. And with that dictionary, he lost interest in, in studying Chinese anymore. So he moved to, to other, other, other stuff. And he, he said that he uh, uh, abandoned this branch of study around 1780. Mm -hmm. Uh, Royal Chinese Museum, the museum was meant to su support his studies of Chinese language and research of Chinese culture. His ambition to collect Chinese objects makes Royal a unique figure among European scholars of the Chinese language because it suggests that in his linguistic studies he was interested to associate the term with the character and he was interested to know actual uh, uh, the, the objects that that character would, that would represent. So his, his museum was housed in the two rooms on the upper floor of his uh, residence in The Hague. In one room was displayed the porcelain, in the other was a study where he kept uh, other objects. And the third room uh, at the front was housing the collection of paintings that covered all apparently all his walls. We, we know all that from the inventories that were compiled after his wife died, his widow died uh, in, in uh, 1820s. At the back uh, of the, the, uh, the room was, was his library with manuscripts, prints, and uh, um, other, other uh, books. This group of uh, scroll paintings uh, that I am showing you here includes 15 sheets measuring between 111, 112 centimeters times 61 to 110 times 59. So they are big, like, like what we would say a poster size. Um, the inventory of uh, uh, the collection from 1860 indicates that these pictures were accompanied with uh, French descriptions, but those descriptions are lost and we don't have them. So all we can do now is rely on, on the uh, uh, pictures. After the death of Rohr and his wife, uh, Johanna Luisa van Openbarenwald, his collection of 827 items was transferred to the cabinet of King William I, and it was kept there until 1883. Uh, and all what has been preserved after that is now uh, divided be between the Rijks Museum in Amsterdam and the Museum of Welkerkunde in Leiden. Paintings went to Leiden. In the early 20th century, um, the, the, the paintings were mounted on a canvas or on, on a wooden frame. And now canvas is stretching, so paper is uh, cracking, as you see. And so this, this desperately needs, uh, needs a restoration. And this is my, my project to, to look at it as a part of this uh, restoration. Uh, uh, enterprise. Each sheet includes between five and nine instruments hanging from a rack uh, or uh, a single nail. And almost every sheet, there is one instrument half wrapped. 
to, to show how instrument was maintained when it was not played or how it was kept when when you know was transported. When the paint, uh, paintings arrived to order, they represented, I think, the earliest comprehensive encyclopedia or uh, encyclopedic overview of Chinese instruments in Europe. Um, but as we know, uh, the, the Royal collection was always his private collection, so that's why nobody actually knew uh, about these instruments. They were never published, and now they were in museum. And uh, I actually came to the museum to look at real instruments, and they say, "Oh, by the way, you know, we have also these these uh, pictures. Do you want to see? It? Do, you, do you, you know, maybe maybe this is interesting to you?" And that's how I encountered these pictures that are actually much more interesting than actual instruments. So before I go any further, I will uh, quickly go through all pictures. So just that you see how uh, how they they uh, look here on the side. Uh, I have what my my colleague Mujian has identified instruments because along the instruments there is a, a, a name of the instrument written in Chinese. They are they are absolutely beautiful uh, pieces. Now we stop here. Um, how did Roy obtain these uh, images? Who painted them? Where they came from? We don't know. All that is is not really clear. Uh, but we have some contextual clues. The Dutch art historian at uh, Dries Museum, uh, Jan van Kampen who wrote a monograph about the Roar, and that was his dissertation that has just been uh, like three months ago translated from that into English. So uh, he wrote, uh, uh, he established a link between English trader in Canton, Matthew Rapper, and that, that name is important for us. Rapper supplied Charles Burney his instruments because Charles Burney has received uh, two two, he says two boxes of instruments that we don't know what it is in the, the what was in the boxes, and he received these these boxes in 1775 and 1777. And uh, Matthew Rafter also uh, was probably collecting tunes for them and all other information. So. Um, We, we have, I have mentioned before that Carlos Wang was in Canton, from Canton, teaching the Royal uh, Chinese language. And uh, Royal, uh, and here we have a connection. So now I'll come. There are three letters of Carlos Wang to Royal between 1773 and 76. And Wang was sending to our, as I said, the books uh, and uh, uh, notes about Chinese uh, language. With the books, he may have included shipments of other items uh, that would have been interested to Roar, because obviously Roar was sending him money back. So, so uh, uh, Wang wanted to sell whatever he could to Roar to, to, to get uh, more, more cash. Because of his knowledge of several languages, Wang was for the Europeans an important conduit in Canton. In his youth, he spent nine years in Naples studying uh, at the Catholic seminary, and therefore he was fluent in Latin. And with the law, uh, Royer, Wang was corresponding in Latin from Canton. 
combines correspondence with Roy, we learned that at one point, one was at the negotiations with the Englishman Matthew Rappen uh, to teach him Chinese, but nothing happened of that because they could not agree on the on the price. Uh, so here we have a, a connection between uh, a rapper who supplied Bernie with Wang who was supplying uh, Roy. This is a crossing point uh, between uh, between uh, them. The instruments in Roy's paintings are representing represented with an utmost precision and detail. Some even shown from two viewpoints, maybe not on the same sheet, but you have this, you see that this is the same instrument from back and for, from forth. I think uh, uh, you see here is here is a chain from the top and here is this chain from bottom. I don't know if it's the same, but you know, we could assume that maybe it is. Drums are shown together with their appropriate sticks. Both instruments together with the bow. Flutes in different tunings are represented in pairs. So it was, it, it, it's, it's not the only uh, picture that represents example of one instrument. It really it, uh, shows, oh, this, this might be uh, flutes in different tunings. So I, I show them twice. Along each instrument is written its name in Chinese. In some cases, the name of the instrument appears to be regional, indicating the specific origin of particular instrument that is represented. We may guess that such an instrument was acquired from, uh, from the collection from a particular place, but that uh, instrument was not endemic to that place. It was widespread, just that the name written next to the instrument shows a particular uh, region. Some instrument types appear represented more than once, but the decoration on the instrument of, uh, and other details indicate that the image, uh, uh, image represents different uh, specimens. And here you see Sanxian, it's, it's the same instrument, but you see that the decoration on, on the instrument is different. So uh, there are there are different instruments represented. Uh, the precision with which the instruments were represented and their particularities make it clear that paintings were pro produced on a basis of real instruments. But I would argue that they are depictions of real instruments. What in turn means that the painter must have on his disposal a significant collection of instruments to represent them, because here we have 90, some 90 instruments. The repetition uh, of the inclusion of the same instrument also gives an impression that the uh, painted set was meant as a catalog of an organized group of instruments. So let us uh, return now to the Englishman Matthew Rapper, who was a trade official who arrived in Canton in 1767 and during the 1770s was a significant trader. John Barrow, the controller of Lord George McCartney during his embassy to Qianlong Emperor in 1792-94, published upon his return to England a book with, with his observation about China, titled uh, Travels in China. Uh, uh, Travels in China, yeah. Uh, and in the book, between pages 314 and 315, there is inserted a plate with some 30 Chinese musical instruments. And in a comment, uh, Barlow says, an English gentleman in Canton took some pains to collect the various instruments of the country. He calls it uh, uh, a gentleman, an English gentleman, of which the annexed plate is a representation, but his catalog is not complete. This line of research needs, needs a further investigation of, on our part, but we could make assumption now that Rohr's set of paintings may represent the instruments in the collection of this European gentleman, who was no other than Matthew Rapper. We know that from other from other sources. Rapper was 
in uh, contact with Charles Burley in 1775 and 1777. In other words, roughly at the same time when the Royal presumably received his paintings. In his article on Chinese music in Lee's Cyclopedia, Burley said that he sent his queries to an English gentleman. He does not name the gentleman, but now from the correspondence between Burley and uh, Matthew Rapper, we know that the Rapper was that, that gentleman. And Rapper had this, this, this uh, collection of, of, of instruments. So uh, in, in a, a continuation, Burley qualified Rapper as a good judge of music who had resided many years at Canton and who transmitted from uh, from uh, transmitted them to different distant provinces where he obtained answers in French and Italian from missionaries long residing there. And our correspondence at Canton not only transmitted to us their answers, but sent with them a complete set of Chinese instruments, among which there was very, uh, very uh, special, uh, uh, every species of flutes, several string instruments of the lute and uh, guitar kind. The passing remark, remark of John Barlow about the collection of Chinese instruments by a European gentleman and Bernie's comment about Rapper's interest in music of different Chinese regions marks Rapper's as an important connoisseur of Chinese music among the Westerners in the living in Canton. Obviously, there could not have been, yeah, I'm done, uh, okay. two more parts. Okay. <laughs> uh, Uh, there, there could not have been many extensive collections of Chinese uh, instruments uh, in Canton during the 1770s. So we do not know the uh, we do not know the purpose which guided Rapper to assemble the collection. But probably he was uh, making making uh, collecting instruments so he can resell them over over in Europe in Europe. To, to assume that the rapper's uh, pictures arrived to Europe in the 1770s, although we do not know the precise date of this uh, production, it is uh, tempting, to, uh, tempting to contemplate where, uh, whether paintings were made before rapper has shipped his instruments to, to Berlin. So in that case, maybe these uh, pictures that we have could be pictures that actually Bernie has received and we, we have lost them. So uh, I will stop here uh, and now the investigation goes on. Do you have any questions? Thank you for the presentation. So, uh, thank you for the presentation. So, illustrative and so clarifying the, the instruments of the shine. Uh, the, the the picture that you, you shared here, yeah, there was uh, several instruments like as a ensemble. There's any relation of the kind of musical ensembles also, or the representative no, ensemble? I don't don't think I don't know, but I don't think so uh, because they they are uh, the instruments. There are du double instruments in in several places, mainly double flutes. But uh, my colleague Murchan says that that they they are probably different a few flute, same flute with different tuning, and that's why that they they represent it. But what's the the shape? Some percussion instruments and another kind of. There are no relations. No, so no, statically. No, no, I, I, not that I know. Okay, okay. Not that I know. I also have a question. You mentioned the uh, restoration process. Um, is it already? No, no, it's um, yeah, waiting for me to publish the article so they can get the. Uh, um, Okay, I, I would just like to suggest a little more about the pictures and the restoration process, uh, namely um, the analysis of the paper. Uh, yes. We are here in Portugal, uh, currently our research units, mm -hmm. exam, 
We had a big research project um, concerning museums in Portugal, uh, which involves a laboratory at the Evro University uh, named Hercules, mm -hmm. and they are now studying the huge um, art collection mm -hmm. because um, and helping them in in, in preservation and other things. And um, this this laboratory, they have huge projects yes, uh, in course, yes. and they, they are also helping us. They will help us with the, the piano that I will speak more mm -hmm. of, Matthias Boston from 1777. So I'm thinking that maybe, and from what I see, a lot can be said to about, the, about exactly. the, 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 the analysis right. of the yes. paper. Yes, you know? yes, 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 absolutely, yes, yes. Yeah, but but you know this is this is kind of a museum part. This is their thing. You know, I don't want to to go into okay. that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's complicated. It's it's complicated I yes. Um, um, because I think that <laughs> they 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 probably know what they are doing. So, uh, uh, and and you know these these pictures have not been. I think they are in storage. They are in storage you now. Um, nobody else. Yeah. Thank you very much for your speech. How, how many pieces uh, do the collection have? Um, uh, the whole collection. Yeah. Uh, the whole collection has about uh, eight hundred seventy, uh, but it's split between Ritz Museum and uh, Leiden. And I don't know in in uh, you know. Uh, ah. I think that the Ritz Museum has the best pieces, and yeah. Leiden has the storage pieces. But but it's it's a really interesting to to see to see the, the pieces that they were collecting. Okay. Any other questions? So sure. thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. Very interesting presentation. Well, now we will have the Prince Silva. If an info, we will not have any Sosa with us. He had to cancel, uh, unfortunately. He cannot be pre uh, presenting uh, even in a remote way. So we will uh, skip any, of course, and go to the okay. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to everyone. So, uh, my presentation will focus on how music is represented in what is perhaps the most iconic art form and the one that left the greatest impression on the Chinese population, population during the Maoist Revolution, which are the propaganda posters. Um, as my object of study, I have selected five posters belonging to the Kuakon collection donated to the Orient Foundation in 1999. Um, this collection contains about 140 posters dating from 1959 during the Great Leap Forward to 1981, still in the aftermath of the Cultural Revolution of 1966 to 76. First of all, it is important to briefly contextualize the importance of the arts within the Chinese society. Throughout Chinese history, art has always been a primary means of propagating correct behavior and thought. This idea was based on the Confucian belief regarding the malleability of the human mind, in the role of education and persuasion to achieve a state of social harmony and, consequently, in the need to disseminate and replicate models of behavior to be followed. The Chinese Communist Party, led by Mao Zedong, when coming to power in 1949, took over this legacy, 
using art to consolidate its power and educate the masses. The, pre the precept set forth by Mao at the Yan'an Forum on Literature and Art in 1942 stated that art should be subordinated to politics, there is no art for art's sake, that it should be inspired by and be made for the masses of workers, peasants and soldiers, and should mirror and simultaneously transcend their daily lives, depicting an, an idealized representation of people's reality, this idea of socialist realism combined with the revolutionary realism. So, it was against this background that the Chinese propaganda posters emerged. The posters have their origins in the, in the pictures produced during Chinese New Year. Their main purpose was to promote the principles and policies of the, part, the party among the masses and to inspire their utmost efforts for the development of the nation. They followed the political evolution of the country, either praising political movements such as the Great Leap Forward or the Cultural Revolution, or glorifying uh, prominent revolutionary figures uh, such as uh, Mao, especially Mao Zedong. They were easily and cheaply reproduced and published, and therefore could be widely disseminated throughout different public and private spaces, such as streets and train stations, factories, schools, dormitories, and homes. This was done to enable the visual memorization of the figures, the understanding of the exemplary models they represent, and thus the almost subconscious some subconscious assimilation of the message. The posters were composed of brightly colored visual elements, usually depicting the archetypes of the perfect individual and society. These images were sometimes accompanied by short but incisive slogans, creating a complementarity between image and text that allows a clear understanding of the idea to be transmitted and assimilated. For this reason, Posters emerged as an effective means of visualizing, visualizing otherwise abstract ideas and, above all, the many visions of the present and future envisioned by Mao and the Communist Party for the nation. It is within this notion of an ideal, idealized society that we can find several representations of music. As a first example, we have the poster Happy Together, which depicts a group of people accompanied by Mao Zedong in the center, dressed in dark blue, enjoying a younger performance. We can see here a group of musicians playing the Swana and the Changha horns, the Dagu and the Xiaogu drums, and also the Arho, accompanied by uh, opera actors. Um, here, uh, here, music appears as an activity integrated in an important political moment for the community, which celebrates the coming of the great helmsman, expressing the happiness of its members in receiving the one who is responsible for their well-being and prosperity. At the same time, the Yang He, an operatic genre from Northeast China, adapted by the CCP during the Yang'an period, which was between 1935 to 45, to convey its political message to the population of the, that region, the Yang uh, The Yang He represents the unity between the people and their leader, who are clapping their hands to the beat of the music, sharing the same joy of making revolution and fighting together their enemies. In another poster, a heavy frontier, several groups of people from the Dai, Hua, Hani, and Lanku ethnic groups in Yunnan province um, are shown dancing and playing traditional instruments. As we can see here in detail, people are playing the Hu Shang, the chord mouth organ, the gong, the symbols, the Xiang Jiao Wu, which is a kind of drum shaped like an elephant's leg, and the San Xian, which is a very <coughs> string Chinese meat. Um, they celebrate the arrival of a new year and the good harvests, represented by the banana and the papaya trees with uh, fruit, fruit, under the auspices of the newly arrived and warmly welcomed People's Liberation Army soldiers and Mao Zedong. Uh, whose portrait is uh, hung in the gate on the background. Um, here, we see again music and dance as an expression of celebration, happiness, and union, 
not only between the people and the leadership Mao, <coughs> by Mao and soldiers, uh, those responsible for their prosperity, but also between the ethnic groups, uh, encouraging a spirit of friendship or brotherhood among them. Um, both in this poster and in Happy Together, we can see the ritualizing aspect of music as was custom in traditional Chinese society dominated by Confucian music. Um, in Confucian musical theory, music has an effect on emotions and rituals in which music was included on behavior. So being part of what seems to be not only celebratory events, but also occasions to worship and show reverence for Mao and the Communist Party, music makes it, makes it possible to homogenize the community's feelings, consolidating its unity and bringing it closer to those uh, they consider to be their saviors and who therefore deserve their deepest respect. Another representation of music can be inferred from the posters is its education, educational function through the promotion of the so-called revolutionary songs. They are characterized by simple and relatively short tunes with didactic or political content influenced by Western or regional tradition. Their lyrics are written in vernacular Chinese, accessible to everyone, and may portray themes such as the pro promotion of nationalism, the motivation for a collective effort to achieve the ideal of socialist society or to promote group spirit. In the poster, we sing revolutionary songs. We can find one of the, the means found by the leadership to encourage the singing of these songs. Here, a soldier appears singing and playing the accordion, followed by a group of people who seem to belong to the peasant and proletarian classes. From this, we can see that for the government, songs should be sung in group in order to foster collective spirit and the homogenization of their feelings. In their vision, the best instrument for accompanying this kind of repertoire was the accordion considered the revolutionary instrument par excellence, both for its practicality, because propaganda needs required instruments that were easy to transport, and perhaps for its association with the feeling of hope in a bright future inspired by the Soviet context, which greatly influenced the use and dissemination of this musical instrument for revolutionary purpose. In line with this logic of encouraging the singing of revolutionary songs, we find posters with some of their ly lyrics printed, as is the case of Lei Feng and the Young Pioneers, where the image of Lei Feng, uh, a soldier glorified for, its, for his loyalty to the party, altruism and frugality, here surrounded by children, um, is, uh, is complemented by the lyrics of the song learned from Le Fons to the example. Uh, I also would like to call your attention to the poster hang on the wall on the, on the left, center left, depicting, uh, depicting a young girl, uh, a pioneer, a young pioneer, weaving two big hand handkerchiefs in which seems to be a performance of a red silk dance characterized by the weaving of long pieces of bright silk, inspired by dance movements of Peking opera and some traditional performances from Northeast China. According to Xi Jun, the author of one article explaining the creative process of this new dance style, it was created to reflect the mood of contemporary real people's lives, expressing a kind of beautiful, lighthearted and happy mood. So, the happiness of this young girl under Mao, Zedong, uh, under Mao Zedong's leadership, imbued with the spirit and good teachings from Lei Feng, is well expressed in her dance and should be an inspiration for the young pioneers surrounding, surrounding the soldier. Finally, one can notice the educational function of music expanded to the field of opera as well. In the poster, The New Flowers of National Culture, Revolutionary Mobile Place, we can find cutouts of scenes from what were the only performances allowed during the Cultural Revolution, the so-called model works. These were called so because they were not only supposed to serve as an ideological and aesthetic basis for the production of new works of the selected genres, which were opera, ballet, and symphony, 
but also uh, presented the model of the individual and society to be followed by the people, as is the case of the characters. Uh, she are, which was the heroine of the ballet, uh, the white hair girl, Li Mei, one of the heroic uh, characters from the opera, uh, The Legend of the Red Lantern, and Wu Qinghua, the heroine from the ballet, The Red Detachment of Women. Uh, they embody the fundamental characteristics of a true communist, such as loyalty to Mao and the party, tenacity, perspicacity, and the spirit of sacrifice and struggle, which are essential to the development and modernization of the Chinese nation. To conclude, we can see that, in addition to the idealized portrait uh, of Chinese socialist society under Mao, Propaganda posters published between 1959 and 1976 involved the role ascribed to music and opera by the authorities, offering clues about their social and political function in the society of the time. Music played a major role in uniting the ethnically diverse people of the territory, as well as in bringing the masses closer to the party. It is also an expression of the happiness, well-being, and prosperity of the population under communism. Um, as an essential part of ritual activities of reverence for the leadership, music presents itself as a regulating force for the emotions of the participants, of the participants regarding the celebrated entities. This allows for the shaping of their mentality and the homogenization of their behavior. Moreover, the posters involve the pedagogical function of music, more specifically of revolutionary songs performed in unison, encouraging their learning. And in the specific case of the model plays, the posters motivate the masses to watch the shows and follow the good examples of the hero's portrait, teaching them the core values expected of a good communist. But if the posters allow the creation of an idealized image not only of society, but also of the function of music and opera within it, it remains to be, to be seen how receptive the masses were to them. For further reflection and research, I would consider pertinent to think about the degree of inspiration of the masses for the staging of musical performances um, through these posters. Uh, whether the posters made it easier to understand the revolutionary songs, and their role on popularizing the model operas and disseminating the values propagated by them. And I would like to thank the scientific committee of this symposium for the opportunity to, sh to share my work. And also thank you everyone for uh, attention. Thank you very much, Beatrice. Uh, is there any questions? Thank you, Beatrice. Um, is, is there any possibility to go further the propaganda system and know how uh, was really the, the performance of music uh, in productions or uh, small um, cities? Um, besides, because what we are seeing is what uh, propaganda wants us to see. But is there any possibility of knowing how it was really uh, beyond the propaganda system? Um, I think there are already some some papers and. Um, and books published about the about this theme. Um, one interesting book uh, I read was uh, written by I think it was uh, Brian the Mayor. He wrote a book about the the role of some propaganda teams in the in some rural uh, places, and. Um, he talks about their role, but also some about some problems the propaganda teams have uh, in their uh, in, in their work. But I think um, 
about to say that uh, besides his work um, about, for example, the the the, the perform musical performance beyond this world of uh, propaganda, um, I don't know if there is much work done. I know that there is some work about propaganda, music and propaganda, but not uh, the underground. Yeah. Uh, I think they are just dead. I don't know the region, but maybe uh, this is maybe the Orient Foundation uh, has some recordings. I don't know. They have it from the model works, I think. Yes. But um, I don't know if. Yes, uh, I'm doing. I'm you are still doing, doing research. Yes, yes, but the, the, their collection of records is. It's so huge, they, I know, I know, and it's sense. not uh, really well organized yes. because of, we, we, we was knowing that's why I'm saying maybe and very probably they have also uh, recordings uh, from from um, from this kind of performances mm -hmm. of uh, of uh, propaganda songs and because they, I I'm I'm sure they have it from the modern works uh, because they receive it from from the donation that this is this pop on collection and. Uh, there is still a lot, a lot to yes. to see and to uh, to do in research, but maybe Beatrice will find something. So I, I, I uh, uh, until today, uh, I just found two uh, records of two very famous uh, propaganda songs: "The East Is Red" and "Sailing the Seas." Depends on the depends on the helmsman. Which were very popular during the Cultural Revolution, but uh, it, it, it's been very difficult to find something because the, 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 the records are not identified and sometimes the characters are disappearing. So, not just a curiosity because if we think about uh, Chinese history, uh, we think, for instance, in the case of Portugal, Sophie Chavier, uh, whose ambition was to get in the, the forbidden. Uh, in country and the forbidden uh, empire, and then uh, after uh, as, as centuries after that, we have the, the Chinese the Mao uh, in Tetu propaganda. So I think we in uh, Western world we know such a little about what is the authenticity of their culture, and then I was thinking about that because uh, nowadays we believe that China is not as close as usually. Was but uh, maybe it's not time. <laughs> oh, and I, I, I remember a uh, small detail. It's um, during Cultural Revolution, but not in the beginning of the Cultural Revolution. Um, I saw some some testimonies from some musicians, musicians, and they they told. Uh, that when they were to the, when they went to the countryside, okay, they were supposed to <laughs> to teach our uh, revolutionary songs, yeah. but uh, in the other hand, they were learning the traditional performances from those areas and the songs from their the music from that area, and so. Because China is a big country, yes. so it's impossible to control <laughs> everything. Okay. Yeah. okay, we still have Nicola and then Antonio. Nicola, please. Just uh, when uh, we are still thank you for the presentation. I was uh, surprised to see an accordion uh, on uh, your picture, and I wonder if uh, other Western instruments were used in these posters. Uh, from what I saw in this collection and in other posters, uh, I think the only instrument represented was the accordion. Maybe in, for example, some vinyl discs, you can have, for example, for the, the piano company, for the, for the record, 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 you can have the piano, record. but in, in the case of posters, I think it's just the accordion because the other Western instruments, especially during Cultural Revolution, were considered uh, bourgeois. So for the elite. <laughs> but that, that, that's that's one part of the question. Yes. But don't forget about the, the performance of, for example, for example, Sachi Abang, how yes. do you say it? Sachi Abang. Sachi Abang, where they used a huge 
um, Western Orchestra with uh, small ensembles of Chinese musicians in the middle. We have that in yeah. in uh, records from the or from the Orient Foundation. So it's like a dwelling. If by one hand they they call it they they seem to be the to they seem to see the Western instruments like bourgeois, bourgeois but, but by the other hand they want to, to look modern. So it's like a symbol of modernity and, yes. and like a way to cut with the with the old uh, Chinese musical opera and tradition. Yes. So it's like a bit uh, strange. It's yes. yes, it's complicated. It's complicated. Okay, Antonio, please. Thank you very much. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot for this extremely expiring um, paper. Um, out of total ignorance, because I'm not a scholar in a propaganda poster from China, but I'm familiar with the propaganda poster from the Soviet Union um, uh, of the 30s, 40s, and 50s, especially also when connected with music and of Mexico and Latin America. So what I am actually interested in, and maybe you may have touched that and you like to explore on that a little bit more, is what makes the Chinese posters kind of unique as far as the visual communication is concerned? That's an, interest, an interesting question. I didn't, uh, how to say, I didn't uh, go deeper in this uh, question, but I think um, it is because they, they absorbed some elements from the traditional New Year's uh, paintings and woodblock block printings in kinds of in the in terms of perspective or the colors um maybe um, it's more or less this but i didn't go further maybe in a, a paper when i have more time to explore this question i will try to develop it but my first intuition is uh this kind of inspiration from the traditional. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, it's a very important question, Antonio. <laughs> Beatrice, for sure, we have. Uh, yeah. Uh, she's she's um, uh, starting her PhD, so she has a lot to think about it. And yes. this is an amazing project and an amazing work, and I'm sure it will be. Um, she will have an, uh, a very good result for sure. Uh, uh, it was a it was a wonderful paper. Just uh, for just out of um, how we say that of curiosity that I wanted to know. It's a great paper. Thank you very much. Bravo. Bravo. <laughs> Okay, now we have one thing because we are, we will finish half an hour earlier. So, um, I, sorry, sorry, Kathleen. Kathleen wants to say something. Sorry, yeah, um, <clears throat> Lucia, I was really looking for the for the paper on uh, on collections in uh, Portugal. Unfortunately, couldn't be there. Uh, do you know, or anybody in the audience uh, knows about Burmese instruments in uh, in the Portuguese collections, knowing the Portuguese were there? <laughs> so. Well, you, you have for sure in the Orient Foundation. And if you want, please write me an email. I have the, 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 the I worked there for one year. So I can give you the contact of Dr. Sofia Sofia Lopes from the Cocon collection or Dr. or Dr. Joana from the other main collection. And I'm sure that from the Cocon they will have something that may interest you for sure. Just thank you. <laughs> I don't know if you have my email address, but please write to the email of the symposium or to my personal email, and then I'm, I will be glad to help. Thank you. So, I don't know. No, Museo de Musica not. Maybe the, the Museum of uh, Ethnology, I'm not, uh, there is also the, the Ethnology Museum, maybe, but I'm not sure, I don't know so, so well. Uh, their collections, but I'm sure that the Orient Foundation will be the, the target on your research in Portugal. So, um, 
Well, um, I was tempted to suggest for us to start at four, but that's not possible because we, we will start um, an online session with the participants from Spain, and I'm not sure if I can reach them to start half an hour earlier. Mm -hmm. So I think that we have to make a big coffee break, but please uh, stay with us for, for the, the other part of the day because we will still have uh, session seven and the book presentation by Professor Doder and Gert Carmen and the closer of the session, of course, and then we will go to the social um, dinner with Fado. I will write then the, the, the name of the street in there and enjoy the coffee break. Okay. Ah, sorry. Yes, please, please. No, no, please, please oh, is the neighborhood, so, but oh, I will see on the internet and I will write the, 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 the proper address, but that's the neighborhood if you need to say it to a taxi driver or something. It, it means in Portuguese it, it makes it cold. cold. It's cold. <laughs> we don't know why they have an explanation on their website, but I don't know why they're not the restaurant. It's, it's cold. But we will see. We have already seen. It's warm. Okay, let's go to our coffee break. So thank you.
Hola, buenas tardes, bienvenidas aquí a, al Congreso. Uh, so we are starting uh, with Maria Isabel Rodriguez López. Uh, the title of this communication is Life and Death through Musical Iconography in the Greek Places of National Archaeological Museum in Madrid. Maria Isabel Rodriguez López, she's from the Universidad Complutense de Madrid in Spain. Uh, she's professor at the archaeology uh, 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 at the Department of Stereographic Sciences and Techniques and Archaeology of the uh, Universidad Complutense de Madrid. And she specialized in iconography of the classical world. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Um, just a moment. Uh, okay. It's okay? Yes, I believe so. Muy buenas tardes, muy buenas tardes a todos. Eh, en primer lugar, pues quiero agradecer al Study Group on Iconography of the Performing Arts y a los colegas eh, portugueses por la oportunidad de participar en este encuentro y también pedir disculpas porque eh, hablaré en, en castellano, procuraré hablar despacio, he, he hecho una presentación en inglés y espero que me entiendan todos bien. Mi intervención versará sobre una serie de aspectos de la vida y la muerte a través de la iconografía musical, especialmente en tres vasos griegos que se conservan en el Museo Arqueológico Nacional en Madrid. Esta colección está integrada por un elenco muy amplio de temas en el que la iconografía musical ocupa un papel notable por ser esta una temática indisolublemente asociada a la esfera de lo cotidiano, a lo religioso mitológico y también a lo luctuoso y las creencias del más allá. La colección de vasos griegos del Museo Arqueológico Nacional es una colección eh, muy rica de cerámica griega que comprende diferentes etapas eh, históricas y además muchas de ellas pues, eh, proceden de, no solo de diferentes eh, etapas de la historia, sino también de diferentes lugares, principalmente el Ática y también eh, la Magna Grecia. Grosso modo, esta colección eh, se originó en la colección real de Carlos III y Carlos IV, que a su vez estaba integrada por el Museo de Medallas y Antigüedades de la Biblioteca Nacional, el Gabinete y Real Museo Nacional de Ciencias Naturales y también el Museo del Prado. En 1871 se engrosó con las adquisiciones de la fragata, de la expedición de la fragata Arapiles, incluyéndose entonces vasos y terracotas. En 1874 se compró la colección del Marqués de Salamanca, una colección inmensa que consta de 944 vasos, tanto áticos como del sur de Italia. En 1876 la de Tomás Asensi, en 1900 la de Georg Stutzel y eh, la última de las grandes colecciones que integraron esta, que es hoy del Museo Arqueológico Nacional, la colección Bared Fisa, muy importante también. Y además hay otra serie de mm, adquisiciones menores y eh, puntuales. En nuestra base de datos del Grupo de Investigación de Iconografía Musical de la Universidad Complutense, dirigido por eh, Cristina Bordas y Ruth Piquer, yo misma me, encarga, me he encargado de estudiar y volcar las piezas decoradas con temas musicales y esperamos que muy pronto puedan estar disponibles online. Como decíamos, Proponemos una aproximación, un acercamiento a la iconografía musical de tres extraordinarios ejemplares cerámicos. 
a través de sus imágenes analizaremos el papel de la música asociada a la fecundidad y la contraposición Apolo-Dioniso a través de la hidria que tienen en la, en la pantalla, su relación con la literatura y el comportamiento de la sociedad ateniense de principios del clasicismo a través de la pieza eh, central y también eh, haremos una particular catábasis para adentrarnos en el reino de Hades y estudiar las imágenes de los ritos funerarios con la cítara de Orfeo a través de esta ánfora mm, atribuida al pintor de Baltimore. En los tres casos vamos a tener la oportunidad de acercarnos también al arte griego de época arcaica, el arte griego de época clásica y el arte griego del periodo helenístico, del estilo manierista, eh, propiamente dicho. El primer ejemplo que hemos elegido es, como digo, una hidria de época arcaica que se atribuye al pintor de Antimenes. En el cuerpo del vaso se muestra la llegada de Dioniso al Olimpo, donde es recibido por Deméter, la diosa agraria, la diosa de la agricultura, Hermes, el dios que tutela a los viajeros, y también por Apolo y Artemis. Completando la escena se han representado además eh, tres figuras eh, de sátiros que completan en el, en el, el conjunto. Dioniso está caracterizado como un dios árbol, un dios fecundo y en sus manos sostiene ramas de vid y racimos colgantes. Su aspecto es majestuoso y solemne. Sus acompañantes, en cambio, los sátiros, como es habitual, suelen ser figuras más espontáneas y más vitales. El dios Citaredo, por su parte, aparece como joven imberbe, como es de figuras negras no se ve demasiado bien, luego en otras fotos lo veremos un poquito mejor. Joven imberbe, ceñida su cabeza de laurel, mientras que Artemis, su hermana, la diosa de los ámbitos eh, libres y de la caza, está coronada con una guirnalda de hiedra. La escena está asociada al culto dionisiaco, un culto mistérico y agrario, y por ello una alusión a la conexión entre la vida, la muerte y el renacimiento. Un culto, por otra parte, análogo a los cultos de Atis, de Adonis, de Osiris o del mismo Cristo. Dicho culto prometía a sus fieles la esperanza de vida más allá de la muerte y como es sabido, en sus celebraciones se entonaba el ditirambo, una composición en modo frigio en la que los coreutas danzaban alrededor del altar disfrazados de sátiros y cuya secularización habría de desembocar en la tragodía, en la tragedia. La imagen que nos ocupa evoca, por tanto, las dos expresiones de la música griega y sus efectos. En el ámbito dionisiaco, el éxtasis es una herramienta, un medio de conocimiento, un medio de liberación cognoscitiva. Por eso, la música de Dioniso es una música delirante, frenética, en la que la posesión deviene a través del ritmo. Una música que seduce a través del pulso y también a través de la estridencia de su timbre. La música, Apolínea, en cambio, propone un entusiasmo sereno, un entusiasmo equilibrado. Se vislumbra así la contraposición entre el espacio salvaje desenfrenado de Dioniso y el espacio ordenado de, por, de la polis regido por las leyes que representa Apolo. La complementariedad de ambos dioses constituye, no obstante, el fundamento del pensamiento griego, el aspecto que unifica a ambas personalidades divinas es la manía, una especie de posesión o locura común a ambos. Apolo a través de la adivinación y Dioniso a través de la embriaguez. 
Se trata en definitiva de dos dioses, dos expresiones del rito y de la música, pero una sola finalidad, el conocimiento. Y es por eso que en muchísimas ocasiones los dos dioses no deben ser entendidos como dioses antagónicos, sino como dioses complementarios. Y por eso, como digo, en estos paralelos iconográficos son muchísimos los momentos en los que aparecen juntos. En este caso, baste a modo de ejemplo una ánfora bilingüe, también que pertenece a la colección del Museo Arqueológico Nacional. Eh, son estas ánforas bilingües que tienen uno de los lados de figuras negras, el otro de los lados con figuras rojas y eh, en uno de ellos tenemos esta, esta orden, este, esta música apolínea, mesurada, equilibrada, y en el otro la música eh, dionisiaca. Realmente, como digo, son dos dioses, dos expresiones rituales y musicales diferentes, pero solamente una finalidad, que es el conocimiento. Y si me permiten, voy a entrar en este eh, para eh, darles a conocer una, eh, un proyecto que se ha llevado a cabo en el Museo Arqueológico Nacional, que todavía está en, en progreso, donde pues, eh, lo que se ha hecho ha sido digitalizar los vasos en tres dimensiones, de tal manera que los podemos eh, ver y los podemos estudiar desde casa pues, con, una, con una gran facilidad. Solamente quería mostrarles, luego les mostraré también en la otra pieza que a continuación eh, comento. El segundo ejemplo que he elegido es un estamno ático de figuras rojas que procede de la colección real y su, su decoración se atribuye a un pintor bastante interesante, es el pintor de Goluchov 37, que fue un maestro activo en Atenas en los últimos años del siglo VI y sobre todo en los primeros del siglo V. Un pintor que gustó de representar por encima de todo temas dionisiacos en muchas de sus obras. Es un pintor de estilo ecléctico, influido por el pintor de Pan, el pintor de Berlín, Eucárides, Misón y otros. Quizá el, la influencia más importante es la del pintor de Berlín y como pueden observar, pues sus figuras son esbeltas, el dibujo de muy fina ejecución. Estamos hablando de una pieza que se puede fechar en torno al 470 antes de Cristo. Los Stamnoi fueron recipientes eh, utilizados para guardar, para contener el vino antes de su mixtura, antes de ser mezclados con el agua. Normalmente tienen un tamaño mediano, un cuerpo globular, un pie bajo y solían tener una tapadera que en nuestra pieza pues, eh, se ha perdido, como en otros muchos casos. Y como su finalidad era conservar el vino, el tema de su decoración siempre está asociado al éxtasis dionisiaco, al simposio, a la poesía anacreóntica y a los rituales desarrollados en torno a las celebraciones del dios. Como vemos, la decoración pictórica ocupa completamente el cuerpo del recipiente y nos muestra un conjunto de ocho personajes barbados que danzan y se distribuyen rítmicamente sobre el fondo negro del vaso, exteriorizando en la mayoría de los casos una gestualidad muy acentuada, una gestualidad propia del ámbito teatral. Su indumentaria, sus actitudes, los definen como simposiastas danzantes. Van descalzos y, sin embargo, visten largas túnicas Largos jitones plisados, son unos jitones de mangas, de, es un atuendo de procedencia oriental, y están cubiertos con imatia, con unos mantos de fino plegado también. Tres de ellos tienen el cabello recogido 
en este tocado, se llama mitra ¿eh? y es una especie de eh, tocado cónico eh, plisado. Otros tantos lo recogen con el sacos o quecrífalos ¿eh? y mm, además eh, tienen todos ellos, salvo este danzante que eleva los brazos al cielo en actitud de éxtasis, todos ellos portan en la mano este objeto ¿eh? que es una, un esquiadeion, esquiadeia en el plural griego, que es un objeto en el mundo griego estuvo asociado al mundo de lo femenino, pero sin embargo en el mundo oriental es un objeto eh, de las más altas clases de la sociedad, incluso asociado a la, a la realeza. ¿no? Eh, en esta danza extática que se ejecuta, el clasicismo griego impone, sin embargo, el equilibrio, la compensación de masas a través de posturas complementarias y los gestos de los personajes que parecen estar captados en un instante congelado. La idea de la asociación de estos personajes con el simposio se refuerza porque dos de las figuras, esta, la que tenemos con el número 2 y la que tenemos con el número 4, llevan en la mano los eh, esquifoi, que son los vasos, los pequeños vasos para beber el vino, es decir, están caracterizados como bebedores. Y uno de ellos, este que tenemos aquí, numerado como octavo, lleva una sítula, un recipiente lustral ¿eh? que está asociado al rito, asociado a la purificación que, se ten, que tenía lugar en las celebraciones eh, religiosas. Además, en esta pieza llama la atención que está situ es una escena de interior, está situada en un ambiente eh, interno y esto lo sabemos pues, por la presencia del mobiliario, el clismos, esta silla, el taburete y también por algunos objetos como este gesto que aparecen colgados de la pared. La relación explícita con la música la tenemos en el eh, intérprete del bárbito y en el danzante estático y el resto de los personajes están girando alrededor de estos dos. Les voy a mostrar, si me lo permiten, porque en este caso eh, se ve muy bien eh, los ocho personajes eh, que eh, forman esta extraña eh, eh, procesión. Eh, aquí como tiene decoración en el anverso y en el reverso, pues podemos ver muy bien, podemos apreciar perfectamente ese paso ese ritmo equilibrado, pausado, esa danza estática, el movimiento de los plegados y todas estas cuestiones que hacen referencia tanto al rito como a la, como a la música. La iconografía que acabo de describir eh, pertenece a una, una serie de piezas que en su día John Beasley designó como los vasos anacreónticos, los anacreontic bases, en referencia al poeta y compositor jonio Anacreonte de Teos, eh, cuya cronología eh, oscila también entre el siglo VI y el principio del siglo V a.C. Como en los poemas de Anacreonte, también en estos vasos abundan los motivos dionisiacos. Se trata de un esquema, de un esquema iconográfico que apareció en torno al 520 a.C. y que estuvo en boga, fue muy popular, hasta aproximadamente el 450 a.C. Y existen numerosos ejemplos, eh, aquí voy a mostrar solamente unos pocos, numerosos ejemplos de personajes vestidos a la usanza oriental, eh, tocados con el sacos, con la mitra, que están eh, tocando el, el barbiton y que llevan también estas túnicas de mangas análogas 
a las que hemos visto en, en nuestro vaso. En algunos casos, incluso acompañados de figuras femeninas que tienen instrumentos de percusión en sus manos, como en este caso, un escrótala, eh, muchos de ellos con el esquiadeion, esa, ese paraguas, esa umbrella eh, que, que comentábamos, eh, y son un conjunto de figuras que incluso podemos encontrar como en esta hidria del eh, pintor de Nicóxenos, asociadas al acto del simposio eh, propiamente dicho. El instrumento musical que acompaña a la danza estática es el bárbito, bárbitos, báromos, eh, se le ha nombrado de estas formas, era el más foráneo de todos los cordófonos griegos y que por eso fue llamado la cítara asiática. ¿Mm? Desde luego, es un cordófono, dado su tamaño de sonoridad grave, utilizado en el simposio, probablemente como acompañamiento de los cantos solísticos, cantos improvisatorios, ¿eh? y también, según cuentan algunas fuentes escritas, como eh, fondo suave arrullo, así lo nombran, de los juegos y entretenimientos en el banquete. Es un instrumento sencillo, un instrumento íntimo, relacionado con el género lírico, con las canciones de amor y con estos poetas líricos de los siglo, del siglo VI, fundamentalmente antes de Cristo. Es el instrumento que tañe también el propio Eros, es el instrumento que tañe Dioniso y, como decía, las fuentes antiguas lo citan también como Barbi, Baromos, y barmos, aunque la terminología que habitualmente utilizamos es la de barbiton. Fue Anacreonte quien había traído de Lidia el estilo musical y el barbito, y su impacto debió de ser importante en los círculos aristocráticos de Atenas, donde se puso de moda el lujo oriental, la lidopatella, ¿eh? es decir, el estilo de vida y el lujo de las élites orientales, que llegó a constituir una verdadera moda, y el parasol un símbolo de estatus. Puede suponerse, por tanto, que los pintores de vasos mostraron a través de sus imágenes la ideología específica de las élites atenienses de ese momento, y que eh, los vasos áticos en este sentido, constituyen la misma evidencia que las fuentes eh, literarias. Ahora bien, hay una serie de interrogantes, una serie de cuestiones que nos tenemos que plantear cuando observamos esta y otras piezas análogas a ellas. Desde el género de los personajes, no sabemos si son hombres o son mujeres, eh, o sea, hombres, perdón, eh, travestidos, disfrazados con ropas de mujeres, con falsas eh, barbas, eh, se acepta tradicionalmente que son varones. El contexto, si es un contexto ritual, si es un contexto de juerga, de simposio, algunos autores incluso han señalado que podría estar eh, relacionado con las leneas, esas fiestas en honor de Dioniso, que eh, tenían lugar en el mes de nuestro mes de enero, en el Gamelio eh, griego, en honor de Dionis Solenayo, etc. ¿Eh? Y desde luego deberíamos de plantearnos también una cuestión que se queda en interrogante, si se trata de imágenes que son eco de una realidad social. El último punto al que me voy a referir... No sé si me oye. Uh, cinco minutos más, por favor. Sí, 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 cinco minutos. Gracias. La tercera pieza que hemos elegido es una ánfora del siglo IV procedente de la Magna Grecia y atribuida al pintor eh, de Baltimore, cuya temática está asociada al mundo de los muertos. El anverso está decorado con una escena funeraria en la que el difunto está dentro de un naiscos caracterizado como un joven atleta que lleva el estrígile en la mano y a su lado se encuentra este, entre comillas, sistro apulo. En el reverso, 
por el contrario, pues tenemos dos escenas, una decoración en dos registros, la parte superior con el canto de Orfeo delante de Hades y Perséfone y en la zona inferior una estela funeraria a ambos lados, un personaje desnudo y una figura femenina que sostiene también un sistroaculo. Lo más interesante a señalar es el rol de Orfeo en este tipo de piezas apulas. Desde luego, eh, Orfeo es el mediador. A través de la iniciación muestra el camino que las almas deben recorrer para alcanzar su destino final. Por eso no se representa a Eurídice. Fue habitual en estos vasos que la presencia del cantor no, no estuviera asociada al retorno de la ninfa a la tierra. Varios paralelos iconográficos también en estos vasos apulos nos presentan el mismo tipo de escenas donde no aparece Eurídice y donde Orfeo es un mediador. Rápidamente muestro algunas de ellas, esta del Museo de la Universidad de Harvard o por supuesto las colosales crateras de Altamura, esta del Museo Arqueológico Nacional de Nápoles, en todas ellas Orfeo viste a la usanza oriental y lleva en sus manos esta cítara, esta en el Museo de Múnich, esta en Kiel, en el Museo de Kiel o esta en, en Taranto. En cualquier caso, en todas ellas aparece este instrumento, este llamado sistroapulo, sistro rectangular, xilófono, ¿eh? siempre asociado a figuras eh, femeninas, siempre asociado a escenas eh, relacionadas con el inframundo, como podemos ver en todos estos ejemplos. Son escenas funerarias y escenas eh, femeninas. ¿eh? Y solamente para, para terminar, eh, comentar que el análisis y la reflexión acerca de los vasos estudiados nos ha permitido aproximarnos al arte griego de diferentes periodos así como a diversos aspectos asociados al mito, a la vida cotidiana de aquel tiempo y también al mundo de los muertos, poniendo de relieve que en todas las facetas de la vida de la antigua Grecia la música ocupó un papel bien significativo. Música de la Kende y de la Yende, música para los vivos y música para los muertos, música como divertimento, música como parte del ritual y sobre todo Música unida a la, vida, a la vida misma, a la regeneración y a la felicidad de la vida en ultratumba. Gracias por vuestra atención. Muchísimas gracias. Well, we have uh, five minutes for even for uh, questions that you can ask. Uh, hola, Marisabel. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, ¿Querés que te pregunte en español? O... Pues es que oigo muy regular, se oye con mucho eco. Entonces, si podéis, <risa> si, si podéis preguntar en español, muy bien, porque no entiendo muy bien eh, ni siquiera en español. <risa> yeah. Me gustaría saber un poquito más de esto xilófono que hablaste al final de tu presentación. Sí, sí, vale. Pues, mucha, eres Lucía, ¿verdad? Sí, sí Lucía. Sí. Vale, muchas gracias, Lucía. Mira, lo que sabemos, he ido muy deprisa al final por, pasarme, por no pasarme de tiempo, pero lo que sabemos es que no hay rastro de este instrumento en la Grecia continental. Todos los ejemplos que conocemos a día de hoy proceden de la Magna Grecia, proceden del, del sur de Italia. Eran instrumentos, eh, a ver, voy a poner alguno para que lo veáis, eran instrumentos, como veis, formados por dos barras conectadas y entre ellas unas varillas, deberían de tener pues, como una especie de sonajas, tendrían desde luego un, eh, un sonido suave, un sonido agudo y probablemente eh, 
aunque su origen podría, busca, podría buscarse, podría rastrearse en Fenicia, así lo han apuntado algunos autores, por ejemplo, Bellía, Angela Bellía en 2011 trató este tema, eh, pero lo que sí es claro que debía de ser una especie de evocación de los sonidos del más allá, del sonido del, del más allá benéfico, vamos, quiero decir, de un más allá feliz, de una interacción eh, con una comunicación, un instrumento de comunicación con ese mundo del, del Allende. Eh. Algunos autores también lo han identificado con eh, un instrumento que es platás o plataje, eh, que menciona Artitas de, de Taranto en un texto, otros lo han identificado y por eso lo llaman Sistro con ese instrumento egipcio que se eh, hacía sonar en los cultos isíacos y en el culto eh, atórico. Y bueno, la verdad es que es uno de los grandes desconocidos. Así es que agradezco tu pregunta y así he podido eh, profundizar un poquito más en, en esto. Dante, ¿y por qué las mujeres? ¿Qué te parece? ¿Siempre he tocado por mujeres? Siempre. En lo que... En lo que cono... ¿Me oís bien? Sí, sí, sí. A mí. En lo que conocemos hasta ahora, siempre son mujeres. Todo... Todos los ejemplos, a ver si puedo quitar esto para que lo veáis. Sí, Ay, bueno, ahí, mejor ahí. Eh, todos los ejemplos eh, que conocemos están interpretados por mujeres casi siempre en un ámbito que podríamos considerar natural, eh, que podría ser una alusión al paraíso, eh, al paraíso terrenal. Y por eso, pues es, y bueno, en ocasiones dentro del propio templete funerario. Esto es un naiscos, esto es un templete funerario. ¿Eh? Aquí lo tenéis también en esta, en esta obra general. Muchas gracias, María Isabel. Muy interesante. Gracias. De nada. Gracias a vosotros. Muchas gracias, Enhora. Well, we will uh, further on with another uh, professor from the uh, Universidad Complutense de Madrid, uh, Ruth Piquet. Uh, uh, she will present uh, music and dance scenes of the 19th century Seville School of Painting, Exoticism and Spanishness. Um, Ruth Piquet is a PhD um, in lecture, at, uh, I'm his lecture at the Musicology Department of the Universidad Complutense de Madrid, and she teaches musical iconography, ethnomusicology, musical criticism, and popular music. You are welcome, Ruth Piquet. Thank you, thank you. I'm trying to make my presentation. Thank you, indeed. Just, just a moment, please. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, this is... Okay, this one. Yeah. Can you see properly the presentation? Uh, yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good afternoon to everybody. Um, I would like to thank the study group and the scientific committee for accepting my, my paper. Uh, the Carmen Thyssen Museum in Malaga features a vast collection of paintings by civilian artists from the mid 19th century. The collection mostly consists of costume-rich paintings with numerous representations of dance and music scenes with iconographic topoi or visual tropes which we will examine in this paper in order to reflect on the importance of music and dance in the formation of the popular idea of Andalusia and Spain in the European imagination of the 20th century. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Can you see the second image? Yes, we can see it. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you. Just to, to be <laughs> sure. The city of Sevilla experienced an extraordinary cultural and social evolution around the mid 19th century due to the arrival of the Duke and Duchess of Montpensier, Antoine d'Orléans, and Maria Luisa Fernanda de Bourbon, sister of Isabel II. Their presence in the city stimulated the economy and the arts. They promoted artistic and musical institutions, as well as art exhibitions. They also protected and patronized the local artists. The old nobility and the growing bourgeoisie participated in these institutions and promoted the art exhibitions. They usually commissioned artworks. The connections with foreign intellectuals and artists who viewed Spain as exotic because of its Islamic past as Al-Andalus were essential in the process of creating art depicting the customs and last landscapes of Sevilla. Moreover, the descriptions that English and French travelers wrote of Spain during the 1830s and 1840s were also relevant, as civilian painters tried to satisfy the demand for orientalized and exotic aesthetics prevalent among European artists and travelers. In fact, some foreign painters ended up living in Sevilla, and many Spanish ones migrated to France, like the Madrazo family, um, studied by Maria Jesus Fernandez Sinde. Many Spanish artists and writers were hired at that time by the nobility and the crown to portray the various Spanish cities, landscapes, monuments, and customs. Among them, I would like to highlight the Andalusian scenes by Serafin Estebanez Calderón, a writer, poet, critic, who wrote a series of descriptions of Spanish customs and traditions with corresponding illustrations. They closely match the iconographic repertoire of civilian painters. First, I will pay attention to a series of scenes from taverns and other meeting places like guest houses, lodges, and inns. In general, they were costume style scenes of indoors location attempting to portray their popular habits and customs. This style of painting was appreciated both by outsiders and by the upper classes for its quaint scenes and its depiction of marginal lifestyles. Foreign travelers favored a vision of dancing that highlighted exoticism and sensuality. But such stereotypes or motifs were also recurrent among Spanish writers. According to Estebanez Calderón, dancing is exaltant and produces sensual provocations throughout the whole body. However, in the iconography of dance scenes, there are elements that don't come so much from literature as from iconographic tradition constituted mainly by the imagery of machismo, majas of Goya and others and popular dances from the 18th century. In order to understand this iconographic tradition and the dance's portrait, we have to go back to the Spanish Bolera School of Dance, consolidated during the 18th century with a vast iconographic production with its, its height point, sorry, in the 19th century. As for its projection towards the rest of Europe, the Bolero form already had a presence in France around 1830s. The repertoire is formed by two types of dances with different techniques, the boleros and the palillos or castanet dances. The dance consists of jumping and leaping movement, turns and complex footwork, including difficult accessor type steps and high steps. The boleros were often included in pieces like seriguillas, fandangos, and other historical dances. In fact, several Spanish and European composers produced a wide repertoire them for guitar and piano, which became known in different books throughout Europe. An example of this is the Encyclopédie Pittoresque de la Musique, which included some seguidillas for guitar by Spanish composer Fernando Sor, along with iconography. In the 19th century, several different boleros dances were developed. The polo, olé, jaleo, cachucha, malagueña, and torero. Different choreographies also emerged at the time with a distinctive scenography, like the majo and the maja, the sultan's favorite, 
The Maha and the Bullfighter, or A Dance in Triana. Titles like, titles like this sorry, suggest that the costume race aesthetic may have some of its roots in the performative experience of the Bolera school, as well as in the literary descriptions. The iconographic tropes of taverns and dance scenes became established especially through the drawings and pictures cards by Jose Dominguez Becker, who, among other collaborations, illustrated a series of lithographies called La España Artística y Monumental, together with Genaro Pérez Villamil, published in Paris in 1842. In the piece entitled Un Baile Gitano, a Gypsy Dance, we can appreciate the type of partnered dance that was so characteristic of the Bolera School, especially in regards to the attire and the presence of castanets or palillos, as well as the distinctive positioning of feet and hands. The title refers to one of the choreographies by Zed School, and the piece also served to inspire the aforementioned Francisco La Meyer's Dance in Triana. Esteban F. Calderón, the writer, writes, there is no dance in Andalusia without the movement of the arms, the flair, and the sensual provocations that run throughout the whole body. Perhaps the configuration of the Andalusian woman of swift feet, flexible waist, triumphant arms, makes her unique for such exercises. And perhaps her fiery and voluptuous imagination, her delicate hearing and exquisite sensibility all turn her into a dangerous tepsicore. The idea of Andalusia as essentially linked to dance and female sensuality is configured by writings like this one. We are interested in the semiotic value of dance, not just as a central element of many tavern ten paintings, marking it again as an essential part of Andalusian identity, but also as an element that serves to dulcify marginal ambiences, painting them as quaint, as well as to present a sanitized idea of the lower classes customs and like genuine gypsy environments. They were stereotyped images of bolera style dancers in lower class scenarios. Several Orientalist painters visited Spain at this time, among them David Villain, David Roberts, and John Frederick Lewis and they depicted Bolera's dances in numerous lithographies which served to illustrate their travel books and which were widely distributed among the Spanish nobility. These painters had a more classicist, orientalizing and colorist aesthetic different to Spanish artists. Dominguez Becker's influence can be seen in the main civilian painters of the mid-century, like Manuel Cabral Bejarano or Rafael Benjumea. Benjumea was a protege of Queen Isabel II. His painting, Dancing a Lodge, was made for the annual exposition of the Royal Academy, Dancing a Inn. It depicts the interior of a modest plate in which a young man danced bolero playing castanets while another one plays a tambourine. A female guitar player has put her instrument down for a moment to talk to a traveler sitting beside her, allowing us to get a look at the guitar's soundboard. The detailed quality of the characters, their movement and gestures suggest the artist's intention to emphasize the quaintness. These models of tavern scenes influenced, in turn, the iconography of English and French artists and the aesthetics of the travel books written in the following decades, like the joint work by Eugène Giraud and Adolphe Desbarreux, two artists in Spain. In Dance in Pusat de Rouenet, there are castanets, rattles, and a guitar visible in the front, enclosing the figures of the dancers in the back. The painting renders a somewhat exaggerated representation of the characters and their gestures emphasizing their exoticism. Open air, open air parties were a central part of civilian life, sponsored by the nobility and the bourgeois. A scenes of outdoor parties were focused in popular festivities or romerias, as it can be seen in this painting by Dominguez Becker, in which a female dancer looks at us while playing castanets. These paintings follow the model of the previous indoor scenes, but try to show the sights of the city. 
In A Dance in Triana, in the Guadalquivir, the riverside, a couple, the man dressed as a majo and the woman in a strolling dress, dances a bolero while playing castanets following the music of a third person playing the guitar. This model is the same one seen in the initial picture card by Becker, surrounding the dancers, an audience convinced the impression that there's noise, there's noise around. Equally relevant is the attraction that had the mixing of male majos and farmers with women, women dressed in strolling or otherwise elegant attire, symbolizing so the combination of rural and urban elements employing the characters apparel and gestures to convey exoticism. Now I would like to turn to female figures highlighted in the paintings following typified models. Civilian artists also painted portraits of the most famous female dancers of Sevilla. They took inspiration from paintings and engravings like this one by Juan Carrafa, but also from some of the female dancers of the Bolera School themselves, since they performed in Sevilla and Madrid. One of the women depicted was the Bolera Josefa Vargas. In this painting by Cabral Bejarano, she's represented alongside the Guadalquivir River, more specifically in the riverside opening up to the Triana district, to the Triana uh, Barrio, Barrio de Triana district, in front of the Arenal and the Torre del Oro, both visible in the back. Dressed with characteristic civilian attire, she is executing a step typical of the palillos or castanets dance. At that time, Female dancers of European fame like Fanny Esler, Marie Rue Estefan, or Pauline de Bernay had garnered extraordinary prestige and developed their own artistic iconography that influenced Spanish artists and the apparel of dancers. The Spanish female dancers had also a notable presence throughout Europe. An example of this is also Manuela Perea La Nena, portrayed in numerous picture cards. Another one of the types of image we can find in this civilian painting school is the interior scene with just people singing and a guitar without dance. This genre is present in the literature of Serafín Estebanez Calderón, Fernán Caballero, and other authors. During the first half of this century, there were a number of pictures produced with indoors scenes in which men and women sing, clap, play the guitar before a table, sometimes after lunch or dinner. Many of them included the present of a nobleman of bourgeois who is watching and enjoying the scene. Since these paintings, paintings often served as a picture card bought by travelers and the upper classes, appealing to the risk of participating in the lifestyle of the Andalusian popular classes. That's also the reason why there are many of the usual tropes from travel literature, bandoleros, bandits, majos, women, and guitars. There are also many images in which the players are, are women dressed as majas, usually sitting and holding the instrument. Now, I would like to focus on this painting by Antonio Maria Cortellini, because it's a clear example of the mentioned type of paintings. Through the window and the back, we can see the cathedral and the Giralda Tower of Sevilla. Cortellini parallels the stereotyped descriptions that Richard Ford made in his travel book entitled Gatherings from Spain, published in London in that same year, 1846. Ford describes the lodges, guest houses, taverns, and inns, and reflects on the musical aspects. In order to feel, I, I'm quoting, I'm, I'm reading just a, a brief quote. In order to feel the full power of the guitar and Spanish song, the performance should be a sprightly andaluza. She wields the instrument as her fan or mantilla. It seems to become portion of herself and alive. Indeed, the whole thing requires an abandon, a fire, a gracia, which could not be risked by ladies of more non third climates and more tightly laced songs. English and French travelers, sorry, yeah. English and French travelers emphasized in their writings the music gatherings that often took place in said location. Baron Justin Taylor stresses the constant presence of guitars and women, commenting on this deep romantic and orientalized image featured in his travel book. He wrote, 
This instrument, the guitar, followed the movements of her, of her, soul, her soul, as the young woman played melancholic follows or the joyful and light seguidillas. Returning to Cortellini's painting, it also depicts a young woman who is playing the guitar in the middle of a tavern, but an old woman seems to watch her alongside uh, two men, one standing at the back and one sitting at her left, who looks at her intensely and who seems to be drawing her attention in turn. This aspect is relevant, I think, because it leads at us to the tropes surrounding courtship. Matchmaker or procuress scenes were already part of Andalusian literature, but the iconographic style comes from the Baroque era, uh, alluding to courtship through a musical symbol, in the case, the guitar. Like all these, these paintings, it's a six strings guitar with simple strings. This is the typical uh, model of, of the time. Around um, <laughs> sorry, I, I couldn't. Solamente más unos cinco minutos, por favor. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, right, right. I, I know I'm almost finishing. Yeah. Around the beginning of the 19th century, the double six strings were replaced by the simple ones, and the new type of guitar spread rapidly. Key to its expansion were the guitar maker guilds in regions like Madrid, Andalusia, and Catalonia, which became decisive in the production of guitars and similar instruments like bandurrias. Around the 1840s, the political powers in Sevilla make an effort to regulate public order and bring the bandoleros under control with the creation of the Guardia Civil. Indoors, painting reflected the authorities' warnings against lewd behaviors and delinquency as part of this traditional quaint aesthetic. Many of these paintings came in pairs. In a drunk in an inn, a drunk man stumbles into a party and seems to be trying to sing or dance, but is ridiculed by all the assistants. To the right, a woman sitting hieratically holds a guitar to convey the festive element and a certain soundscape. This particular artwork was paired to another entitled The Quarrel in which we can see a group of around 20 characters of different social strata mixed together in a kind of hectic composition representing the chaos of the typical tavern. One of the characters is lifting a guitar to smash into the ground. A notable correspondence can be seen between this painting and some literary scenes by Esteban Escalerón, like El Roque y el Bronquís, which describes how a guitar is thrown in the middle of a tavern fight. To conclude, I would like to stress that one cannot fully comprehend the Sevillian Costumbrist School of Painting of the 19th century without regarding music and dance as a constitutive element of the genre. Painters keep coming back to his motive motive to satisfy the desire for quaintness and Andalusism by the higher classes and foreign buyers who commissioned their works. At the same time, civilian paintings from this period are a key source to understand the importance of bolera dance and its artistic reach, as well as to comprehend the fascination of artists with guitars and dancing as symbols of Andalusian and Spanish idiosyncrasy which would be reproduced again in the lighter artistic currents and periods. Gustave Doré and Davilier's travels through Spain in 1862, which they profusely illustrated, again so how artists from the 1860s and 17 tried to accentuate the exoticism, offering a vision that exaggerated the gestures, the dances, and the characters. Thus, the pictorial tradition established by the Sevilla school in the mid 19th century, like its literary counterpart, underwent a transformation during the last decades of the century. On the one hand, to the necessity of an authentic folklore identity brought about by the work of ethnographers and the historical interest around flamenco, visible in works like the Andalusian folklore by Antonio Machado and many others. This development can be observed in the works by Jose Jiménez Aranda, among others, 
The Orientalism of Mariana Fortuny, who was an ethnographer, painter with an aquarelle aesthetic, influenced these painters and also did the evolution of the bolera style to the flamenco. Fin de cycle artists kept, fin de cycle, sorry, artists kept the themes of dance and music again focusing on guitars and female dancers with the intention to glimpse into the scene of gypsy and flamenco culture, now understood by Spanish artists as a part of their real identity and not just a product of the trends coming from Europe. <laughs> However, they accentuated the same exotic and eroticizing vision in the end, deepened the stereotypes and became entrenched as the paradigmatic image of Spain in the eyes of Europe. Thank you so much. Thank you, Yes. Uh, the most uh, pictures uh, that you present uh, reports to the 19th century. There is uh, one reason for this choice, a romantic uh, Italian, for instance. I, I couldn't hear properly. Could you please repeat or? Uh, the most uh, pictures that uh, you have presented uh, reports to the 19th century. Yes. One reason for this choice, uh, romantic criterion, for instance. Uh, if I understand, if there's there's a romantic criterion for this selection, I, I didn't understand. Right? Asking uh, if it is, uh, bueno, está preguntando si es un, uh, un, un, una tendencia uh, romántica para para ese tipo de escuela. De, de, sí. Charles. Yeah, of course. Uh, the, the, the Sevilla School of Painting was uh, involved in the romantic imagery and romantic uh, thinking, uh, the thought, the romantic thought of the of the 19th century. They were deeply influenced by romantic imagery, literature, and all these all these kind of, of things. But at the same time, they they try as as uh, as romantic uh, idiosyncrasy did in general sense. They try to um, show uh, uh, their their own identity, and for this, they search for the most uh, um, particular dances and the most. Uh, Mm, proper dances of the of the um, low classes, uh, uh, even if if there's a very very standardized and stereotype uh, representation. I, I don't know if if I answered your question or it was. Um, the question is uh, about the this bolero fandango uh, nineteen uh, dance. Ah, he's, he's asking if uh, Bolero and Fandango is a 19th century dance. Right? Ah, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Now, now I understand. Thank you, thank you so much, Florence, and thank you for the question. Yeah, no, no, uh, no. They were previous dances, historical dances uh, like Bolero and Fandango uh, that were developed, especially during the 18th century, both in Europe and Spain, uh, with a um, transnational uh, relation between Europe. Especially France and, and Spain, and um, uh, but particularly the bolero dance. At, I have seen uh, with, uh, um, I mean, the, um, a, a more uh, gesturalized and a more, um, so to say, um, deep sea um, idiosyncrasy behind. Uh, is typical of the 19th century, but bolero dances and uh, fandangos come from previous cycles, come from previous. Uh, the centuries, especially the Belo Pit in the 18th century, but the um, the idea of a kind of, of fusion of these boleros and fandangos with the gypsies uh, dances is of the 19th century. Thank you very much. So, Palacios, 
Bienvenido, Fernando. Uh, Fernando Palacios has a question. You can ask. I can see them here. Uh, Hello. Uh, I, I speak in English because maybe. Yes. Thank you. Well, yes. I am Spanish, but. Uh, no, no, for, but uh, so maybe I other person. I, I will. I will do my best. Because uh, yeah, uh, thank you for your presentation, and I I I think these uh, uh, pictures are very interesting uh, because I was thinking in the history of flamenco. Mm -hmm. no? And the history of flamenco, there is a lot of uh, histories from flamenco, no? And one of them is that the, the mix with the gypsies that came from the 18th century from India, the Romis, and they mix with the, the, the farmers in, the, in Andalusia. But I think these uh, pictures make clear that uh, there, there was a lot of uh, tradition that after became flamenco, yeah. Yet in the 19th century and probably before, no, because all the gestures from the dancers and the instruments as well, no. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not specialized in, in flamenco, but there are many, many studies uh, which says uh, flamenco is constituted um, as, as we know it uh, in the last decades of the 19th century. Uh, especially based on this fusion, uh, on this hybridation between bolera, bolero school and uh, gypsy dances. Because um, um, in, the, in the mid of the 19th century, many of the dancers um, who danced boleros were gypsies. Uh, the female dancers were um, uh, middle class or lower classes, but uh, many of them were gypsies. Um, who were educated in the academies and in the schools. And in the last decades of the 19th century, uh, after our development, uh, this mixture uh, generated um, what we know as flamenco dance uh, with this uh, fusion of uh, bolera school and, uh, and some movements of the gypsies dances and, or more loud classes dances. But I'm not, I'm not a specialist, but I, I can recommend you um, some studies. Uh, but, but have you got an idea, for instance, why a gender, a gender like a bolero, uh, that it goes to flamenco, but not as, a, as such, no? as a gender? Because we, seguirillas, for instance, we have like uh, with the same name on flamenco, no? And in flamenco, maybe we have like uh, mm -hmm. seguirillas boleras or sevillanas boleras, but no bolero as, as a gender. Yeah. And I would like to, to, to ask you if you know uh, why and as well if you know if this bolero was as well uh, one of the go and back, ida y vuelta, no? To America and develop some mm -hmm. kind of uh, principles of the bolero in Cuba or is nothing to be? I think so. I think so. There was a, a transference to, to America, but especially with the fandango. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure if with the seguidillas and boleros, but especially with the fandango. And um, yeah, many, um, the name bolero is, is more um, a sign or, a, or a, um, a way of a description of uh, especially this kind of steps in which uh, the dancers uh, move the, the hands and the, and the feet uh, in a very special manner. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was more an, an adjective um, applied uh, to seguidillas and fandangos. And, but oh, okay. uh, in the end, in the end uh, it comes to des describe uh, also uh, a kind of, um, of idea of dance. But uh, in the beginning, it was just uh, an addition uh, explaining the, the kind of steps and the kind of movements of the hands. Oh, wow. Yeah, okay. That's what I can say. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Antonio Baldassar, you want to ask something? Yes. Thank you very much, um, um, uh -huh. Ruth, for actually sharing all these fascinating images with us. Um, what, what I was a little bit puzzled about, and that's, I think it's very interesting because you actually contextualized those images that you have shown us um, very isolated as something that um, has uh, more to do with, um, let's say the emergence of an Andalusian style or an Andalusian identity, or let's even say an Andalusian 
uh, um, um, idea or an idea of Andalusia, so to speak. What, but what is so intriguing to me is when I look at the topics that are presented, they really are part of a European art history. Um, mm -hmm. uh, which which really make them part of um, of a discourse in which actually the peasants, the law class, dancing, uh, women playing um, guitars or stringed instruments come into the discourse, and this has a lot to do with the this um, um, how you say that uh, with the link between art history and social history. For instance, when you look at paintings um, of the late 17th century or early 18th century, which were produced in the Flemish and um, and um, Dutch paintings, you are actually very close topically, not stylistically. Stylistically, something totally yeah. different to your uh, to your material, and I think that's very interesting. So, from your point of view, I absolutely pay what you have told me. But on the other side, there is also a, a broader context which actually yeah. puts your material into a broader context of art history, social history, and what's going on in music history in the uh, in Europe during the 19th century, and what, what they refer to, because I think, um, and there I'm an ignorant, in um, 17th century Spanish art, it would hardly be possible to show this kind of pictures, which are able, uh, which are possible then in the 19th century, as far as topics are concerned, not style, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. It was uh, a very interesting reflection, a very interesting comment. Yeah, I, I think so. But, um, yeah, I, I don't know if, uh, as, as as far as in the in the 17th century, um, in fact, yeah, well, uh, there are many influences of the of the Baroque school of painting and the subjects uh, in the in the painters of of the 19th century. But I think uh, this transference between European uh, imagery and the Spanish imagery or Andalusian imagery are especially uh, developed in the 18th and 19th century. Because of the of the, um, of the um, uh, opening of uh, uh, Spanish uh, uh, dances and um, uh, the idea of of, uh, of Andalusia, because of the uh, enlightenment um, uh, around Europe, no, uh, along Europe. So I think this this uh, transference between Europe and, and Spain are most um, strong, are more strong in the 18th and 19th century. And of course, I try to, to emphasize to show uh, the connections between the European artists and the European uh, and majority and, and Spain uh, most of the time. I didn't mean really to, to signify that I, um, there was only an Andalusian um, identity or an Andalusian imagery. My, my point was, um, um, European, European thought, European uh, idiosyncrasy, um, have to we have a, a last question for you, and we have to rush a little bit. Oh, okay, 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 sorry, sorry. Yeah, thank that, you very yeah. much. Thank you very much. For this. Discuss. Thank you. Yes, thank of course. You. Fisher, please ask. Hi, Ruth, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you for a fantastic presentation. Thank you. Uh, I was triggered by a remark you made um, uh, concerning the Beko Pear painting of a dancing couple. You said it's a dancing capsule, if I understood right. And um, actually, I would be very much interested if you think that in creating this topoi of Andalusian culture, um, uh, referring back to antiquity or to myth mythology, kind of classicism played any role in the period of time you presented her. Okay, thank you so much. If I understand properly, you mean this one? No, it wasn't that one. It was a painting of this one, yeah. Yeah, and sorry, can, can you repeat the idea of um, some classy sign? Um, you said it was a dancing tapestry there, right? Ah, yeah. Well, yeah. There was uh, there was a writer, uh, Serafín Estebanet Calderón, uh, who writes about the bolera dances and the notion, the idea of Andalusia at this time. And uh, he wrote uh, something like, "Yeah, uh, um, the the female dancer uh, dancing bolero." 
uh, were like uh, a dangerous terpsichore. Um, but uh, I think at the same time, uh, the paradox um, uh, is that, uh, that the imagery, the, the stamps, the pictures are not very exoticized. And um, well, uh, I don't know uh, if Esteban Ed Calderon is thinking of any classical imagery, but uh, what I know is um, that uh, Jose Dominguez Becker and the painters um they don't have uh, classical models they, they don't have uh, they, they don't look at classical models they, they look more to goya they look more to to baroque uh, spanish baroque murillo and this kind of painters and and they look to the scenography and the, per the performance sorry the performance the real performance of the of the dances i don't know if i answer your question or, or i understand understood that's perfect thanks thank you Thank you. We have to, to go on. Uh, now we are traveling to Latin America. Fernando Palacios. Uh, he is from the Pontificia Universidad Católica de Ecuador, Center of World Music, University of Hildesheim. Uh, PhD in Ethnomusicology, Master Degree in Hispano American Musical Heritage, Professor at the Pontificia Catholic University of Ecuador. He is uh, going to present traditional musical instruments on exploration and interpretive proposal. You're welcome, Fernando. Okay, thank you. Uh, can you hear me right? Hello? Yes, 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 you can start. Okay, it's just to, to check. <laughs> so, uh, hello to everyone and thank you to, to the committee organization and to all the work that you have been done. And I, I would like to present you a project that I am developing in Germany now in the University of Hildesheim and i hope it's not so out of focus of your topic but is uh, is uh, related to a collection of musical instruments so can i share my screen yeah no okay yes uh yes you can okay can you see it now okay You can start. Yeah, I'm coming. Okay, so uh, this is a project that is uh, I I I am developing the Center for World Music, that is uh, an institution in in the University of Hildesheim, and is an ethnomusicological research center with an international orientation, regional commitment, and local rotation. It is an archive and a laboratory is a place for research and study, uh, a meeting place for musicians and a basis for international encounters and understanding. Uh, it is placed in an old church, it's a very beautiful environment as well, and it has a huge collection of instruments, musical instruments, it's the Wolfgang Lede collection, they have more than 5,000 instruments. Um, from many cultures and many countries and many places and they are very interesting instruments. So I was thinking what, uh, how can we uh, interact with this instrument? How can we be more close to, to a collection of instruments more than just we, we normally go to an exhibition and we see the instruments in a showcase and the instruments are there. So I try to develop this project is called Undu is like an invitation to, to, to participate, it's playing with sounds, an invitation to explore with traditional musical instruments. And here I can, I, I can show you here, these are some uh, drafts that I was uh, drawing uh, on how can I present these instruments in such a way that people can participate in them. So I developed a process, uh, I amplified these instruments with electric PSO micro, uh, contact microphones and uh, in such a way that if you touch these instruments, 
it will sound a lot. All the things that you do in the instruments, even if you touch them very softly, you will hear and you can have a perception of the sound of the instrument very clear. And I think another way to approach to the instrument. So it was a challenge to look uh, for the right structure, looking for hooks to fix the instruments and many things, no? And as well to have a deep listening, uh, I was working with headphones. These are some of the, the, the final solutions. I work with a mixing board and two speakers. And then here you can see the, the contact microphones and different structures. No? This was the final result that I put the instruments in this uh, metal structure and depend on, on the instruments, it was a different, uh, different way to, to, to place it. No? But how, uh, uh, what are the possibilities to approach to these musical instruments? Well, at first is from the sound itself, um, from creativity, because I am very interested in, in to be creative with our, our things, our environment, and looking for the acoustic possibilities of these instruments. As well, working with unconventional tunings, because I didn't modify any of the tuning of the instruments. And mo that there are many instruments that are there maybe for, I don't know, 60 years without touching or 100 years. Uh, and they have their own tuning during this uh, period, no? So I think it's very interesting from an acoustic point of view. And I was uh, go deep in the, into the morphology of the musical instruments. So through the materials like uh, wood, metal, or different materials, the textures of the instruments and the, the, the forms or, or the structures itself. Uh, as well, I use uh, different elements to explore these instruments. I use the hands, I use the stones, drumsticks, beans, uh, the bow. Or... There are many possibilities to approach to, to take different uh, sounds and different perceptions from the, from the instrument. As well, I, I implement in some moments some sound effects like reverb, delay or uh, some of them. And this, uh, I, I would like to show you a video that I made uh, with uh, some explorations in some instruments from different countries and different cultures. And after this video, I will talk to you about the workshops because the, the project aims to make different workshops with different people that can access to these instruments in an open and accessible way. So I will show you, I will show you this video.
So after this exploration, I, uh, uh, we work with different workshops with different peoples and different ages, uh, cultures and procedences. And for instance, uh, I, I, we start the workshops with some Zoom recorders and headphones and the, the people uh, explore the environment with just with sound, explore the leaves, the trees and different things before approaching to the instruments. Uh, and then... I'm sorry, uh, we are a little bit uh, late, so uh, uh, you, you only have more five minutes, okay? But I have just present uh, 15 minutes, no? Yes, we do have more five minutes. Well, okay. So I, I just have this... Uh... 10 minutes, no, I'm sorry, 10 minutes. Okay, yeah, that's different. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, well, uh, 10 minutes is okay. So yeah, we, we work with five participants at a time and we uh, all of them, they have headphones and they can hear each other. So it's a, a, a group uh, interpretation and it's a way to approach to the instruments to, to take out the instruments and um, so, for instance, this was one of the workshops. I just, I'm going to put you 20 seconds of this. And these are people that they are passing by. We put it on the, uh, on the outside. We put the instruments and they don't know each other in this group. And they are interacting one with, the, with another uh, with the instruments. This was one of the workshops that we did. Um, for instance, we have this uh, second workshop uh, where we can see, for instance, the exploration of the... All the sounds are from the computer. second workshop and some future actions is that I would like to to test uh, to take the instruments to different uh, spaces for instance I would I like to go to an hospice and to bring the instruments there and to a psychiatric hospital or rehabilitation center to I would like to 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 have uh, the sharing with other people that are may maybe in other situations and can go through sounds in another way. And as well, I want to do a live performance of this. And I have this idea that uh, I would like to share you because while I was exploring the instruments, I found, I found it very fascinating to go into instruments that you can approach to many aspects of the instruments just by touching them and working with sounds. So you can access to the materials, you can access to the acoustic, 
but as well you can go through the culture and the uses of these instruments because if you go for instance with this drama you can see which materials are it made and how it was built and then you go to search in this culture so I, I, I proposed a kind of explorative and creative organology where from the exploration and the creativity you can access to all these aspects to the, from the instruments not just like uh, studying them as a uh, diet entities, no? So some conclusions and results, no? Uh, I think it's an alternative access to musical instrument collections, uh, new approaches to sound, new forms to approach cultures, uh, new, some different possibilities for interaction with other people that you don't know through instruments. I think it's a space for creativity and a way to rethink in the culture and the access to culture, not uh, in maybe not a conventional way. So, thank you. Uh, yes, there's a question from Luzia. Luzia Rocha. Hi. It's more a comment. I think it's interesting that you are exploring the benefits of music um, and musical instruments um, in, in patients' health, like, in, like you told that you are planning to. Um, did you thought about applying it also to children who have uh, um, medical problems or what do you think about the a younger public? Uh, yeah, we, uh, we we work as well with uh, with uh, children as as uh, there was one photo of the workshop that uh, later on they came uh, families so parents with the childrens no and but I think the workshops must be like a, a it, it must be developed depends of. With who people are we going to work with? It's not the same to work with children or work with uh, in a psychiatric hospital or work with people that are passing by. I think because, for instance, children needs like another uh, process to access to the instruments because sometimes they came and they just they play, you know, and and it's important to like that there is a process to access to the instrument, not just to go and play. That's why I think it's important these activities that we made first, that we put headphones and we go walking through the area, just uh, listening and perceiving another sounds, no? Um, the question was about uh, children with uh, special needs. Yeah, yeah, this is, uh, this is uh, I would like very much to do this. I have been working with children with special needs in a project with traditional instruments already in Ecuador, and it works very well. Just another thing: How do you plan to measure those benefits? In in how how do you plan to to put it in 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 on paper on graphics? How will you measure the benefits of of that? For example, Experience. on 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 people on children with special needs. Yeah, I, I, I am not so much always into the quantitative uh, results, you know, I think in humanities and in music as well, we are much qualitative and I think the qualitative, yes, there are many ways to, to, to measure this, no? you can make interviews, you can talk with the doctors, or you can talk with the uh, you, you can have a form and to feel and you can make, I don't know, but I think uh, I, 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 I feel and I believe that uh, the, the primary reaction from the people that I can perceive, for instance, the, the one that I perceive during my workshops and during my experience, I think is so positive, you know, and it, it is in the scope to write an article, but I think the article will be more focused on the process, you know, and I think the process is so important because always things are changing and the process shows us how can we develop things. Uh, I don't think it's, uh, it's so uh, important and necessary to measure the final results and see if this 
you know, like to prove uh, by numbers or by specific data that this is working or not. But for instance, when I work with children with disabilities in Ecuador, we were uh, making a process with the therapies on a community based project. And, and it works. You can see the reaction in, in the in the children's, no? But yeah, you can measure, I don't know, some specific systems in, in but I don't I don't I don't think always is necessary, you know. Thank you, Fernando. Uh, we have a question from Antonio Baldassar, doesn't we? Thank you very much, Fernando. Um, actually, I really liked it. And uh, first of all, I have a lot of questions regarding your project. And first of all, I think it's um, very, I'm very happy to learn that the Lade collection was finally finding a home after that my alma mater has rejected to host it. So anyhow, um, I have a couple of questions, but I really want to focus on one issue, being myself involved in a project with the Humboldt Forum in Berlin. Um, there is a crucial, as you may um, realize, there is a crucial issue. Um, um, and now I'm a little bit shifting the, the, the topic here from before um, about colonialism. Uh, colonialism meaning that you are actually um, using the objects um, of the traditional, um, the traditional instruments um, now in a completely new environment and even estrange it from, let's say, musical practices which were connected to the musical instrument. Is this a concern that you are into it or is that of no importance to your project at all? Yes, yes, I am very concerned of it. <laughs> this is on the table all the time. And in Germany, I think more than maybe other, uh, as, uh, other places, no? And we, we were talking a lot with uh, the directors of the Center for World Music, because as well, they have this worry, no? If, uh, how can we use the instrument, no? And we make a selection, for instance, at the beginning, and we don't use any ritual instrument or any instrument that we know that is uh, from a specific environment that is, uh, is not like a, it's not right to take it out in another one, you know? So we try to use just yes, instruments that we know where they come from. We know uh, the history of these instruments, so we can prove that, you know? And this is how we have been working not to to agree no to agree the 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 the, the, the instruments or, or, or the object and as well the idea is for instance when we make these workshops we we did it with the with the team of the center and they know uh, they have all the knowledge of the instruments so every, anyone who wants to access to this knowledge apart from the experimentation of the exploration they can have it from the people no but the idea is in a concert to have some uh, diptys with the information writing down of the instrument so you can have all this background as well, you know. But for me it's important as well because I, and this is something that I, I, I felt and I discovered that I, I, I don't think that I am not respectful with the instrument when I touch it. You know, I think it's beautiful and I think it's beautiful for the instrument as well to be alive again, you know, and, and to, for instance, if I touch this drum and it's making of these uh, uh, lines of uh, le le leather, no, of an animal, and it's very, very, uh, it's very different when you touch this and you have this perception of, oh, this was an animal here. And, and then you go into the history. How do where, where this instrument come from Tanzania, from this group, and they do this as this way, they 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 build this instrument in, in that way. So I think it's another approach to the instrument. But I think always uh, with respect, you know. Be and that's why I use these uh, uh, contact microphones, because with this contact microphone. You just have to touch the instrument and you will hear a lot. It's not necessary to, to hit or to do hard or nothing. No? And I think this is a... But in that way, we select the instruments and we make a Great. selection of a few instruments that we can prove the background and whatever. Thank you very much. I have to come to Hildesheim very soon. Thanks a lot. <laughs> okay, so I am close. So. <laughs> thank you, Fernando. Okay, thank you. Okay, we already had the pleasure to hear Christina Santarelli this morning. 
so um, now we are going to hear Christine Fisher with um, well, Christine Fisher. Um, Senior Research Associate at Lucerne University uh, of Applied Art and Science. Uh, she studied in musicology, uh, Italian literature, and history of art at Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich and University of California, Los Angeles. She's presenting us uh, collecting digital art, future perspectives on musical visual studies. Okay, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, can somebody start with our one? Can everybody hear me out there in space? Uh, I'm on my own, so. <laughs> How can I proceed with the slide? You must click on all the bottom. Yeah, no, no, no. Uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> so what I'm presenting here as the nearly last paper of the long day um, is new territory for me. I assume for some in the audience as well, and I hope for myself that there are not too many IT specialists among the listeners here. It is new territory for me, not only thematically, but also in terms of the sources I have used. They are all open access publications from the year 2021, an absolute novelty in my work as musicologist. But all kidding aside, the topic of digital collection has taken on tremendous relevance in recent years, which I think fits very well with the theme of this conference. Because blockchain technology has created new possibilities to make art digitally collectible or to make digital art collectible, visual art as well as music. This barrage by some as a bubble that will soon burst, the new collecting activity based on so called non fungible tokens is for others the ultimate trendsetter. Whatever might prove true in the future, the practice of digital art collecting anyway questions some fundamental notions we connect with collecting art, maybe even the divide between private and public that is part of the title of our content. At an important beginning of the digital collection history that I'm trying to trace here was William Pett. I'm quoting here for the first time with good conscience from Wikipedia when I tell you that this 8-bit GIF animation of a flying cat, its body made of a Pop-Tart and trailing a rainbow, was created in April 2011. After being published on the LOL Comics website, it was uploaded to YouTube with the version of the song Nyan 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 Nyan, I don't know how many Nyan, by Nico Nicadubo, loser Romo just a few days later. of the GIF, an online game was developed on the same subject. Finally, in February of this year, 2021, this year, 2021, Neil Cat returned to the headlines. A version of the GIF digitally tagged via non-fungible tokens with a certificate of authenticity had been sold for the record sum of 300 either, at that time a little less than $600,000. Meanwhile, alternative marketplaces for digital art have emerged on dedicated platforms 
such as wearable or foundation, which are racing to revolutionize the art and music world. Non-fungible tokens are digital certificates of authenticity that are our minds via distributed ledgers, which means decentralized databases, including one possibility blockchain. These non-centralized technologies, which are therefore more difficult to corrupt, can create digital certificates that are considered unforgeable in very elaborate processes. In these data chains, all work-related data, including author details and any previous owners are mentioned. A true dream for provenient researchers of future generations. Linking such a non-fungible token, which has a significant value in itself due to the complex production process, not to mention a deep ecological footprint, linking it to a work of art lends its authenticity and thus increases its, increases its value. This digital certification of authenticity differs from current cryptocurrencies used today for non-fungible tokens in that they are unique, we'll say not exchangeable for an equivalent value. At the beginning of the use of NFTs was the certification of tweets including the very first tweet ever from Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey or of video game sequences signed by the inventors of the game. Particularly in the wake of the pandemic, as opportunities for musicians to perform live concerts and go on tours and thus sell merchandise at such events disappeared, Musicians also began to distribute their albums and songs via platforms and with non-fungible tokens. Inventive combinations between the digital file with different material editions became sales hits. Kings of Leon is much cited who distributed this year's album when you see yourself in a package for $50. The token came with both the file and a vinyl edition of the album. Other musicians like Lindsay Lohan hold auctions of the NFTs of their songs and albums. Chantel, a singer from the Bayless, has conquered the NFT platforms this April for her music. In her case, the sale of the music file works with exclusive editions for the buyer. Free tickets to all tours are a possibility, the insertion of the name in the lyrics or a cameo in the video of the song. As far as visual art was concerned, Mike Linkelmann, known as Beeple, had already become a millionaire and hit the headlines in March this year. The 39-year-old assembled his digitally generated images into a collage of his complete works and certified their authenticity via an NFT. The opening bid of the auction held at Christie's in London was $100. After several days of bidding by over 30 participants, the work was finally sold for over $69 million. Christie's, for the first time, omits the usual information about material and size of the artwork. The image actually exists only as a file. As the only measurable reference point besides the picture to be seen on the screen, the digital size was mentioned. 390,168,313 bytes. The main thing praised by artists from the music industry with regard to the possibility of NFT marketing of their music is the independence from the authority of a record label. Through the marketing platforms, artists can come into direct contact with their fans without intermediaries such as agents and record labels and already predict that in the long run, the possibility will completely replace larger record label contracts. But record labels have already entered the NFT market on behalf of the artists offering NFT packages on their behalf. For example, on the 30th anniversary of the release of the Nate Dogg song, Nobody Does It Better, Best Row Records offered three exclusive necklaces for just over $30,000 each 
with a 3D file of the necklace and authenticity certified audio of the song. And in July 2021, Closel, a platform that developed the first NFT music player and music marketplace, announced its move to generously sized headquarters in Miami. The business of the platform, which aims to provide artists with a fair market model and support them in their creative vision, is to act as an intermediary between artists and fans with resounding success. And this is the red page here. And get more information. New agents, new intermediaries have thus established themselves almost as quickly as the new market itself. The fact that uh, they have already poached experienced staff from major labels such as Sony speaks for the similarity of the function of this platform to a record label. So far, the market still seems to be a niche in that distribution seems to be limited primarily still to a fan base of cryptocurrencies considered to be rather small. However, when Christie's and Sotheby's announced that they will continue to operate in parallel in the future, will say that is to auction both material and virtual art, the stage will soon become much broader than before, at least in the area of fine art. The Art Basel, which ended last week, recorded for the first time in its history and on the very first day of the fair, the sale of an NFT by crypto artist Olive Allen for about 25,000 euros. In addition, numerous crypto starts, startups are apparently already accepting art NFTs as counter value for loans. So the market is widening. Max Hollein, the director of the Metropolitan Museum in New York, offers an opposite perspective. Although he sees revolutionary potential in blockchain technology, including for the art market, he sees NFTs primarily as a means of popularizing cryptocurrencies, which are currently traded primarily in niches. Art, then, is not actually an object of authentication of these NFTs, but merely a welcome vehicle for popularization practice of a niche market. I was particularly struck by a paragraph in Vanessa Silvera's article in the Calliope Arts Journal. She addresses the fact that what is sold for a lot of money can actually in many cases be downloaded as a free copy from the internet be the picture, music, or video. She writes, couldn't I just download one for free? You could, but that's missing the point. It's about ownership and bragging rights. It's the difference between owning a print reproduction of the Mona Lisa versus owning the Mona Lisa. Also, creators maintain all intellectual and copyright rights to their works. Buyers acquire ownership rights after purchase differentiating their NFT as the original, which can carry a certain prestige and appeal. On a sentimental level, it's the feeling of owning something one of a kind that you will be able to cherish for years to come from the convenience of your desktop. And it's at this point that things get really interesting from an art theoretical and, if you will, aesthetic perspective. From a historical perspective, Digital media are very often portrayed, ultimately in reference to Benjamin, as the first movers for a new negotiation of the place of art in society. Precisely from the point of view of the declining value of the original, the direct encounter with art due to the technical reproducibility of the work of art was thought to be endangered already back in the 19th century. The consequences of this way of thinking were far reaching, especially on the art and music market. Sampling techniques led to a completely rethinking of the relationship between original and copies, up to the realization that it is no longer possible to distinguish between original and copies. Philosophical perspectives on remix practices 
as well as investigations into the cultural practice of copying and pirating in music, ultimately led to a new understanding of history. Reception did not focus on the reception of an image or a piece of music after its creation, but history was thought of as a multimedia stream of reverberations of forms of reception and prefigurations in the futures and the past. This new approach to history was linked to a fundamental shift in the understanding of work and authorship. The cult of genius and the immutable form of the work so deeply rooted in 19th century musical culture that they still have fundamental effects on the market today were softened, dissolved. The relationship between writing and music was redefined and performance became an object of research. Multiple and collaborative authorships became conceivable, networks of collaboration became a new paradigm of music historiography. From my point of view, and especially on this point, I look forward to stimulating discussions, the NFT thus thwarts via digitally certified authenticity, a development of deconstruction of authenticity previous, previously fundamentally attributed to digital media. Even through the arbitrariness and multidimensionality, the hybridity of net culture, the fundamental human need for uniqueness shines through. Through an elaborate process, we encounter in NFTs a resurrection of singular authorship and unalterable forms of work, the need to possess the real Mona Lisa from the hand of the only master Leonardo. Even more, NFTs already allow themselves to canonize music history. Beeple, the first NFT millionaire in the field of fine digital arts, has already opened up a lucrative new field of endeavor with Green New, described as a quote, memory place of the metaverse. We know distributes iconic moments from politics, music, fashion, and sports by certifying them with NFTs. From conversations with musicians, people concluded that there were particular performative moments in their careers that generated special interest among their fans. To identify the moments offered on the platform, Lino also partnered with Time magazine. The buyers of these iconic moments certified in this way will also receive with the file a high quality screen on which they will be able to play the quiet moment in endless group. People announced at the launch of Wino a paradigm shift by the NFT regarding, I quote again, how we conceive of our shared experiences and how we celebrate remarkable achievements. As a final example of digital art that plays precisely with the idea of collecting and is therefore especially tailored to the theme of the conference, the random garden shopper by the media group Picnic should be mentioned here. The artwork is the robot, which is equipped with $100 every week and uses it to order items on the darknet, which it then has sent to the address of the exhibiting gallery. These items then form part of the art collection. At an exhibition of the random darknet shopper in St. Gallen, Gallen, Switzerland, there was a scandal because the orders exceeded the limits of the legal and the bot was confiscated by the police. A media group for Bitnik, who kept up to date via social media about the well being of the darknet shopper in police custody. While we as university educators think about mechanisms of inclusion and exclusion in music history curricula, it seems that music history and visual history is already being written on a very different level and away from an academic discourse. A history in which ownership and expansively constructed authenticity, as well as machine generated coincidence, have become central criteria for inclusion in the canon. And the history of music in which so called classical musical cultures have not yet found an entrance, at least as far as I can judge. A historiography that is based on a collecting culture that, 
apart from the endless loop screens and the NFT merchandise, in many cases gets by without material things that does not require storage, uh, storage space, and which in itself is already laid out by your media, which automatically links image and sound in the iconic historical musical moments and can thus become the central object of the study of music and visual cultures. Ultimately, this is a development that leaves out the fundamental humanistic questions about the theme of art and ultimately declares a canonizable debt which is tangible and sellable. Now it is certainly not the right of the academic perspective to insist on just mechanisms of inclusion and exclusion which it has bypassed for decades and to claim for itself the definition of what is and what is not art. But it remains to develop academic perspective on NFTs, including a terminology to describe how these mechanisms of collecting and thereby canonizing work function. And ultimately to relate them to whether NFTs establish themselves as a bubble soon to burst or as a memory culture of the metaverse. Concluding from the consistency of the music culture's belief in authenticity, I tend to the second assumption. Thank you very much for your attention. Is there any question about this team? Lucy, I, I just wanted to comment and to say to you that I'm completely ignorant about your thing, but I, I think it's, it's a very interesting subject and uh, it's, a, it's a very pioneer insight that, that you are making in, in, in a new field of studies and I like it very much. So <laughs> thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you. Well, I would like to thank you also because okay. I, I'm as ignorant, perhaps, or maybe more than Lucia. And I think what you brought here is a, a, a reflection that all uh, we all have to do, and and to to get to the digital revolution that we are every day listening. So thank you very much, Christina. Thank you for listening. <laughs> So uh, now we have uh, the last presentation of this panel. Uh, we will have three colleagues, two are here. Um, the third one is online. Uh, it's, the, it's a working process of the autobiography of someone which is a very important personality of uh, our of Portugal, Portuguese uh, musical history, um, which is uh, Helena Sai Costa. Uh, we are receiving uh, Jorge Castro Vivaldo, Helena Acosta de Lujo, and Gomes de la Lujo. But I uh, uh, was informed that they will uh, present, the three of them will present all uh, the, this uh, working process. Uh, um, on, about the autobiography of Elena Sai Costa, but we will start with Elena Costa Luz. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, okay, don't worry, don't worry. Yes, and no, because you are too hungry to stay here, so don't worry. <laughs> and I would like to welcome uh, Elena. Uh, Costa, I don't want to start the presentation. May I start? Ah. Thank you very much. Uh, um, to, on behalf of my two colleagues, I want to thank the oh, organization of the symposium, the CTM symposium. It's a great honor to be here. What we are presenting is only a project in course. It's a little bit more than an idea. An idea. But um, it's it's being built. So today we'd like to to show you some of um, our perspectives on this project of building a photobiography of the site Costa, which comes uh, with with three. We work uh, together 
with a colleague from the University of Ohio, uh, Elena Marini. We did a, we published a diary of the mother of Elena Saikosta. So we uh, have, uh, well, Eric and Elena, of course, they are part of, the, of her family, so they know very well the materials that exist at home, and they know very well the lives of their um, relatives uh, in the previous generations. Uh, I, as a musicologist and a musicologist, I have a contact, and we um, do it, the work of editing this diary of um, Lil Neil Moreira Tsai. We, we had the opportunity to uh, go a little bit deeper on the um, fabulous uh, family archive um, with documents about the, a long generation, uh, a long dynasty of musicians in the city of Colombia. So today we start by our dear colleague, uh, which is a nephew, just like uh, Enrique. Um, we have a side question. So, we, we prepared um, short presentations of each one of us, and we we'll have, we'll, we'll have a little bit of time in the end. So, Elena, thank you very much for being very important. And now, um, it's for you. I'll change our uh, slides here. Okay. Well, yes. Um, I will thank uh, the ICTM organization for this possibility of uh, presenting these visual documents in the construction of the photobiography of Elena. Uh, can we go, because we have only eight minutes, so yes, it's a photo that we like very much, and if you don't mind to go, yes, okay. Yes, so what we want to really, I would like to look at some visual documents of her life and to answer the question, why to publish a photobiography of Elena? And so we could say because already we have three already large publications, uh, Philip Pitch, um, Tradition and Re Renovation from 96, uh, Elena Costa herself in 2001 when uh, I'm life in concerts and also um, there are also the, the, the journal um, Art Musical in 99, and uh, where um, Elena Costa, A Life of Enormous Richness. So we have some documents. Why to go uh, further? Why to go? Because there are many unpublished documents in the archive of the family, and some of them are visual documents documenting specific events unknown or revealing other facets. So we'd like very much to, um, to uh, present documents from the archive, music programs, photos, uh, letters, posters, um, to uncover parts of Elena artistic and pedagogical life, and also to outline moments and trajectories concerning meetings with different persons. So really, um, uh, what's precisely what? Um, the inspiration of the photobiography itself in the biographical method, of course, we are really searching for turning points on life and career, of course, which are really clear marks. And also, we are also looking at activities that were really going through several years, several decades. And so really also, um, this is not as exactly a turning point because they are very long in our, and we have here this well, quite summary, let's see, of many moments that some of them uh, are here and of course we are looking at these first steps on li uh, in life and music uh the teaching piano since uh, 34 1934 also the concerts of course edwin fisher the expansion of the international musical career the concerts in the united states etc um also the summer courses which were really very crucial in her life uh, main historial, of course, uh, during 40 years, and the Mozarteum in Salzburg and Gunsbach, 
and also other aspects that we would like to also to talk about or focus is as uh, she was an artistic director when she was already in the 80s in uh, the spring festival and also of course more the directive part of her life and as director of the musical concerts organization of Lyon and also as president of the first directive board of higher education music school in Porto Polytechnic. So if we are looking to some of the, to the first photo that we have chosen, that I have chosen, of course, um, it, it's a really a, a turning point. We can consider this because um, she has 12 years old and uh, she has already played in other auditions and other things, but she's really doing her first uh, solo concert. And um, really she's uh, with her new dress, a very special dress. And um, she appears as older than she is. And she looks as probably um, interrogating her future life as a musical in a musical career. The program is quite, we are not going to see it, but she's playing Beethoven in Mozart and Schubert, etc. We can go to the, the second one uh, when, yes, and this is really a photo which I really, I praise very much because it's um, probably 45 or 50s. She started her pedagogical life as a teacher, uh, private lessons and piano private lessons uh, in 34. Oh, uh, uh, she got her diploma and then she's invited in um, 39 to the National Conservatory in Lisbon to take the share of Vienna de Mott. And, um, and she st stays there till 45. Now, this photo um, can be two, two things can be her um, in final uh, 45 with the students as the last um, moment where she's still uh, the teacher in the conservatorium or is her class of private lessons later. So this is something that needs research. But nevertheless, it's a quite um, classical picture um, in the, the positions of the persons, but it raised many memories and many of them that are here um, were students, the colleagues, through friends, through her life. So can we go through, please? Yes, you can go through because I'm not going. Yes, and this one is already um, on a, the, the international musical career after the Second World War, and this is exactly in '55 when she is in Zermatt courses. Of course, our, she's going there with her sister Madalena to play uh, to Pablo Casals. Of course, she plays several times there, but um, she's with Reni Gianoli and uh, Cristina Pimentel and uh, Conceição Macedo and uh, also in Elise Scala. And um, I think that photo, uh, besides its power of communication, um, is also a symbol of how much the musical international relationships are, were and are pivotal in the construction of a career. Can we go to, and this is already sometime later, she's in her seventies already, and is in 98 and she's in the eighties and she's playing a, a master course on the interpretation of Bach, it's Gunsbach in, in uh, Alsace. Um, and it is the center of um, uh, Albert Schweitzer and, um, the course in Gunsbach was something very special for her, very uh, warm feelings and emotion, probably by her admiration of Albert Schweitzer because of his work and also by his love of Bach, which was shared by her. And uh, can we go for another one, please? Can we go further? Yes. And so we are approaching this eight minutes and I would like to remember some celebrations and also mainly the, um, what the Casa de Musca is doing every year. Elena died in 2006. And after that, Casa de Musca starts in 2007, I think, with uh, this um, uh, event, event, which is um, the 100 tech list. So the 100 keyboard players to Don Elena. So young musicians and music students come to play during one day in the several rooms of Casa de Musca in a very, with a great intensity. And last one, yes, last one uh, that I choose is really a, a, a painting 
by Bertha of Souza, as we know, she was a composer, a pianist, a director. Um, Elena is in her late 50s, as we can uh, see in, uh, by researching in the several in the archive. And um, Berta was a frequent visit, a colleague, a good friend. And um, she has been close to her grandfather, Bernard. She was a student with her father, Luis Costa. And um, Elena played her music and Berta wrote for Elena. So she captured the power of communication of Elena. So thank you. Yes. Uh, I begin uh, with my best regards for the committee and we uh, a little story. Uh, in, um, on uh, April 24, 2005, of uh, Brendo visited the Elena Costa at uh, his home in La de Paz, no, Porto. Uh, and uh, there we, he wrote in an autograph book, Man and Mask, a difficult relation, but it makes life worth living. But are been students of Edwin Fisher. The uh, aim of this presentation is to debate this question. Is Elena Costa a kind person uh, behind the various masks that she has been wearing in her life as a daughter and sister? as a pedagogue, as a concert pianist, as director of a concert society, as a member of a jurist. Uh, in fact, all of uh, who over the years have lived within a uh, side concert learned from her uh, the concrete meaning of the term kind. This is the living meaning of the K word of a life <coughs> of familiarity, not only with the artist, but also, and above all, with the person. In fact, which one of us doesn't remember the advice, the phone call, the introductory letter of the postcard, the tea, or lunch? And which of us does not integrate each of these gestures in the gift of more of his knowledge that he transmitted and formed generations of students and parents? This double gift, that of the person and that of the artist teacher, ended up raising in us the awareness of a debt to her, which can only be resolved by the feeling of belonging to her, after all, large family of us, that of Helene, that of Aunt Helene, that of Donna Helene, that of uh, of Signora Donna Elena. This family began being by being centered in the Casa do Lado da Paz in Porto, later became polarized in national conservatories, expanded with the public of national concerts and international tours, and continued to reproduce itself in courses and competition, pianos international. How many are we? Hard to say.
after x Thus, we see that around the added knowledge of the interpretation and teaching of the classical, romantic, and modern piano repertoire, another knowledge seems to have come together a sour view made of measure and delicacy, respect and knowing how to welcome the other. Two types of knowledge that constitute in her two ways of contenting the world and to that extent celebrating the life that possesses between us all. It is perhaps in all the elements that we find one of the most beautiful expressions of that contentment, so freedom, which makes him say further on, we smile quietly at our own gods and the trust conversation in a sea elephant song. But everything godly feels to me like that. It is in this sense that he speaks of the celebrations of life in Elena Saikos. But maybe we still haven't said everything we could say. Perhaps it's now so possible to name the temperament, that inner discipline which in it decanted emotions and thanks to which life and arts bore fruit. Ego said that all art is in its essence poetry and that its essence is the establishment of true. What true and to establish in the cycle? The need for a, an intimate alliance between the art of living and that of playing. Let's meditate. The ultimate. Thank you. No, no, he's uh, with me. <laughs> I just selected um, some of um, um, symbolic uh, photos. Well, not symbolic, but exemplar um, uh, photos and per persons and moments. Um, because this this project is is going on, so it means that um, um, there there is already a structure and the number of collaborators to uh, work on this um, project. But there's still much work to do about uh, Elena and uh, well and all the documentation that the family has. So, Elena Moreira Saikosta, as you may know, and you know this, uh, was a pianist, pedagogue, and music promoter. Uh, she had a very important international career as a concert soloist and a teacher. A uh, concert soloist, it means she played uh, both with orchestra or um, just alone, or also in chamber music groups, of course. Um, she collected countless documental testimonies of contacts, uh, artistic partnerships, and tributes of uh, a lifetime, just as uh, uh, Eric just said. Um, the connections that, that she made with uh, many different uh, people, and also her uh, wonderful personality. Um, she was famous among her students because she wasn't ever uh, angry, but Sometimes she moved on her nose. It was a sign of not being pleased with their performances. But um, 
as far as I know, I, I've never been her student, but as far as I know, she was very kind always with everybody, um, pushing up for the good qualities of each one, which is um, a very good characteristic of cheap teachers. Uh, so the photographs are an important part of the family document collection, just like Elena said before, <clears throat> and new clues to further understand the life of Elena Saikoshna and scope of her activities in modern uh, Portuguese history and culture, uh, and countries where she was active as a teacher, solist, or jury member of the many international musical competitions are some objectives of this um, of this um, project. So uh, I've chosen first this um, this image. I don't know if I look. No, I didn't. Well, uh, in, in her um, book, she speaks about this moment, this very special moment. I would like you to 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 see that we are in Beethoven Hall in um, uh, in Berlin, and this is um, a class, Clemens Klaus the director and um, Helena is a very young uh, woman on the piano we can see that she's playing we see behind that the room has no audience except some maybe uh, invited special invites and what is this uh, during her period in Berlin she was um, well she, she had already finished her uh, Paris uh, period of, of uh, study with um, uh, Alfred Courtois and, um, uh, and, and, and Edwin Fischer. So she moved with her sister to Paris, to, to Berlin, uh, just in years before the Second World War. And she was uh, regularly invited to perform uh, during. Um, in private houses or also in uh, public events. This was during a conducting course for students of, uh, of conducting for future uh, masters. Uh, she's playing the third concerto of, of Beethoven and maybe uh, Clemens Krauss is not in a, a regular position of a master, which would be uh, before the orchestra, but he is on the side looking at her, of course, but maybe looking at the same time for a student conducting the orchestra. Maybe. Uh, she speaks about this, about this episode. It was suddenly that she was invited to go and play the third again concerto, but uh, well, her, uh, her repertoire was very extensive, uh, so uh, she maybe had it on, on the fingers. We can see that she's not uh, using the score, so um, it was something that she was really uh, used, to, used to do this. So this is a, another picture in, in Palacio de Villa Viçosa, in the Villa Viçosa Palace um, in May. She's playing here with her sister, Madalena Sai Costa, and uh, uh, they uh, had a, a, a trio, the trio Portugalia, and they toured uh, extensively the country, um, making the small concerts in, in small villages. She always blamed about the bad pianos that she had to use, uh, and she speaks in her uh, memories about the wonderful instruments that her trio companions had. Uh, one uh, Stradivarius and one Montagnana. I can't remember which one, um, it's, uh, or the violin or the cello. Uh, and usually, usually she had uh, very bad pianos to compare these uh, wonderful musicians. But here in, in uh, Villa Vissosa, I can believe that she had a good, uh, a good piano. Um, well, we can see a little bit about the audience, and also we can compare. Uh, the paintings, maybe this is your Dordio Gomes, I don't know, uh, but we can compare uh, in, in 1957 what looks like the, the same room. Here is again um, the duo of um, Helena Sai Costa and Madalena Sai Costa uh, performing live at the RTP, the Portuguese television uh, company. 
Um, something that they did uh, often um, during the 60s, and this do was really, um, really um, very uh, active. And I think the, the, the purpose, the, 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 well, the activity of Elena in chamber music is to be studied already. And um, okay, this is also a testimony. This is a, a wonderful photograph made in Madrid at Casa de Lascaz, and it portrays Elena Saikosta, uh, her, her close friend, uh, Raina Giannoli, a uh, French pianist, and the composer, uh, Olivier Messiaen, and his wife, the pianist, Yvonne Lorio. Um, this is, well, a testimony of the high level net of contacts that she had um, around uh, Europe. She also developed a, a very important work in her own uh, city, in Oporto. And here is a photograph of um, being uh, cherished by um, conductor Jean Fournier, which, uh, which um, sometimes came to Porto and directed the, the symphonic orchestra of the CD. Um, here, uh, she just has played uh, maybe and, um, symphonic variations of Sans Sans, uh, I think. Yes, this, this is last photo. The jury of the competition at Conservatory Nacional de Lisboa in 4th uh, December of 1986. Helena Matos, Helena Sai Costa, Maria Cristina Pimentel, Dima Alentão, uh, guitarist Walter de Silva, and Fernando Afonso. Uh, in this contest, um, the winner, absolute uh, winner, was the famous jazz pianist Mario Virginia. <coughs> And so that's why uh, we chose this uh, photograph. And also because here there's the portrait of her grandfather, the founder of the Porto Conservatory of Music, Bernardo Moreira de Sá, uh, which was a very, very important promoter of music in the world. So um, <coughs> the objectives of this photobiography project include dissemination of figure and legacy of the Lena Sai Costa and public presentation of unpublished photos and personal stories related to her. This is just a little, little bit of what we've seen today. Uh, these materials will serve also, of course, researchers, students, and general public with new insights about her place and her career. Uh, the expected involvement of national entities, musical institutions, and schools in the project will allow also the enlargement of information available and new initiatives related to the pianist and her legacy. So thank you very much for your attention. So is there any questions from Lucia? <laughs> May I ask you to put the last uh, photo? Yes. Just a small comment. Um, I think that the painting that is behind the group uh, has musical iconography. I think that is Ukulele uh, Mystico, and it's just just an addition to yes. to to the to the interpretation of the photography. Yes. Because it, I think it's a very Ukulele no, Mystico. Kalita, qualquer coisa que existia. But it seems to me like a, a famous painting with musical iconography, but maybe uh, it is possible to check because yes. the photo doesn't come out. Uh, I just have uh, one question. Uh, why the, the event in Casa de Musica is 101 young finalists? Why the number 101? And just to finish, I, I just want to say that as a Portuguese and as a musicologist, it's an honor to have a presentation with the name of the Nina Psycho. So thank you for bringing this support for us and for our audience. <laughs> Maybe Elena, uh, which uh, presented that poster of Casa de Musica, may answer you. Can you, Elena, please? I I was just. Just a few. Uh, <laughs> yes, why one? Elena, you want to connect your mic? Can you answer, please? 
and the dish of them. You have to you have to put on your mic. Yeah. Yes, okay. well, I, I think that I think that the question was why 2014? Is it was it the question? Was it the question that was 2014? I, I didn't understand very well the question, but uh, I think that why this is, has, has been selected is because till 2007, Casa de Musica has maintained this celebration, which is really um, a very interesting and stimulating event. I don't know if um, I answered. Uh, Elena, Elena, sorry, the question was why 101 uh, keyboard players? Oh, okay. This is Casa de Musica can, can explain why 101. <laughs> because I know that there are many more than 101. But in start, they were 101 because it was really um, already Elena. Uh, mm, no, it was not. I, I don't know exactly because when it started in 2007, um, we didn't yet celebrate the 100th year of her birth. So why I don't know why 101, but probably George George knows about. I think I think it was because. I don't understand. I don't think. Okay. Uh, she she was born in 2013. Yes. Sorry, 1930. 930. So, uh, one and, and one birthday. And so they choose uh, 101 uh, young pianists to be present at the okay. Casa Musica. Okay. This is a very nice event. It, it, during one day long, uh, from the very early morning to the night, um, students from music schools around uh, Porto are invited to come and do a small uh, concerts. So oh, that's why they call it because it's a celebration of music and gathering. Is there any questions from uh, the other colleagues that are from here? I can't see any. No? No? Is there any question? Well, thank you very much for being here. And Good luck with your working process. Thank you very much. <laughs> so now we have the presentation of the, the instrument, isn't it, Professor? Yeah. And it's going to be here.
Well, thank you for your patience. We are still at the end of a very long and very good, very active day. Um, I would like to uh, give you uh, some images and some ideas about uh, a very important uh, restore, restore, uh, process of restoring uh, of an important Portuguese historic capsule. And I think uh, it uh, fits perfectly into the theme of our conference, a piece uh, uh, of, uh, of art, of art in a public collection. Um, <clears throat> let me start with, a, with three minutes of uh, music, for example. We are hearing uh, just before entering the image uh, section. We are hearing um, two movements of the first sonata of Alberto Gomez de Silva, uh, one uh, of uh, only two composers who saw his works published in the second uh, half of the 18th century in Portugal. In this case, Sei Sonate. Uh, the uh, Paragrafo, the Alberto Gomez Silva, published uh, in, in Lisbon about 177, we don't know exactly uh, in the year of the, uh, of the edition. Um, first sonata, two movements, second and third movement. Also, there's a three minutes, but I think we will keep a quite, quite good impression of the sonority of the system. Sorry, that was the third movement. Let's hear the second again, because second is played with a, a very special stop of the Hamburg with the lutes.
Who is playing? That's the man. Start to give a very special thank to the board of the direction of the Lisbon uh, National Music uh, Museum. Uh, I should uh, thank uh, as well to the art artist Professor uh, Juan Paulo Janeiro, who made a recording with these uh, six sonatas, and he was very, very generous to give us the authorization to use it for a CD to be inserted into the book. Third, and a very, very, very special thank to Gerd Kammer, who made all the work, all the artistic work, artistic professional work. <laughs> and we had just the occasion to hear the result of this. Okay, I will give some ideas about the, the historic process of this one. Uh, we have been quite, quite um, lucky to get this uh, harpsichord uh, at the proposal for a restoration process because it was an instrument in quite, quite good condition. Uh, and we found uh, an ambience uh, nationally and internationally uh, marked by a very great and new interest for Portuguese. Uh, Hunting um, building. And uh, finally, we uh, had the occasion to use uh, the news and the new investigation results uh, about uh, the Antunis family, uh, which was active in Lisbon during the 18th century. I'm referring to a book published by uh, Anna Paula today about these construct uh, builders. Family. So, uh, the instrument here it is, the star of, of our evening, uh, had a, cer a certain uh, specific characteristics. Um, it was an instrument which uh, takes part of a roll of 10 conserved instruments, harpsichords. Of Portuguese, the Portuguese masters. This one here is the last in uh, the row, built 1789, uh, the last one, as I called, of these uh, 10 instruments. Six of these uh, instruments are real country chords, four of these 10 instruments have been converted into a pianoforte. That means simply that uh, the place where normally the checks are working, are <coughs> there are inserted little hammers just to change the instruments, the sound of instruments from flat sound uh, sonority to, to uh, percussion, perc uh, percussion sonority. So that's the end of, <clears throat> of the restoration. From the six harpsichords between these 10, uh, three harpsichords have been restored outside the country, in Germany and in England. And this one is the first, the fourth of this uh, instrument, the first which have, has been restored here in Portugal. I think that's quite, quite important. About the authorship of the instrument, we don't know um, for whom the instrument was built. And we know that the year of construction is 1789. Um, it was built by one of the members of Ant uh, Antunes family. 
um, very, very difficult to say which one, because the instrument has only the inscription number of year and Antunish. At that time, from the Antunish family, only two have been still active. Two of the sons of um, the father Antunis. One of these sons is uh, Joaquin Jose Antunis, uh, which left us some instruments, very nice, very fine instruments. And uh, we uh, concluded that looking at the characteristics of the instruments built in here in Lisbon, we couldn't attribute the instruments to Joaquin Jose, but before to his brother, his younger brother, João Batista Antunes. So that was uh, our conclusion, but I think there is no doubt um, about, about that. Where was the instrument coming from? As I told you, we don't know the owner of the first owner of the instrument and uh, the person for whom the instrument has been built. But six years after the building here, we uh, found the instrument in a documentary, um, which was a list of uh, uh, the belongings of Francisco Xavier Batista. And there appears a description, a very nice uh, description. And uh, we can uh, conclude that uh, the instrument is quite, quite the same. So it was in the family of Francisco Xavier Batista. And um, we can uh, say that with uh, high certainty that the instrument was real, uh, really for that owner at the time. The instrument appeared then only in the 40s of the 20th century in the collection of the musical instrument of the Conservatorium Nacional, the Rural Skyetanos. Here is a very old and original photo, photograph, photo image of this instrument. As you can see, um, it's quite complete uh, with, uh, with supports um, and uh, with uh, the checks missing, we found them later on. But um, the instrument uh, really uh, afterwards, after the first exposition, uh, couldn't come out of these expositions because the expositions um, uh, closed up and uh, went to uh, deposits, uh, to depositories. And, uh, only uh, in the last last years, uh, this harpsichord uh, made part of an exposition, a new exposition in the Museum of Lisbon. The instrument um, was in part in, in very accept, in very uh, reasonable uh, conditions when it came to the workshop of care. Here you can see and uh, can keep a fine um, impression about uh, more or less uh, the middle of the restoring uh, process. Um, the works they had uh, to be done are referring to the case, to the soundboard, to the stops and the rest, uh, the pins, rest pins, and the place where the keyboard is inserted here. Finally, we uh, get uh, verified the interior of the instrument, of the case. Uh, there was not necessary to make any major intervention. The instrument had and still has the screen painting, which is not original, as you can see. The original um, 
painting color is, is light green. And we can this light green find also in other instruments, as a purpose instrument. So the interior part of the instrument, you can you have here an, an, a view of the inner structure of the instrument. Um, please note that the instrument is put uh, upwards, uh, upwards. So uh, this is the downside, downside up, and this would be the other side. Just to see the structure of the instrument, which we uh, <coughs> found a little, uh, a little strange, extremely hard, ex extremely firm. And not all the parts are really um, very, very uh, bright, very, very brilliant, as you can see. But these, all these pieces are original. They would be, would be necessary to substitute this. Here, uh, a view from downside up to the soundboard. The soundboard are secured by ribs. The soundboard itself is painted. There were there were a, a, some cracks, original cracks, cracks not uh, provoked by uh, exterior influence, but just the uh, cracks uh, resulted from the um, bad joining of the planes. The soundboard is not one piece. There are several planes um, glued together. Other really other tricks uh, uh, later on to see <coughs> them and to see one of the open space which are natural. And here we saw some restored tricks of the keyboard, of course, the sound part. Sorry, sound part. Here is a part of the bridge. The original tracks couldn't be used again because they were in bad conditions and Gerd decided to make copies of these original checks. You see four of them we had checks for both the stops and uh, the bad conditions are really um, here upside um, where the plectrum is inserted. You can see the openings for the plectrums. The stops are here, two stops, with upper and down, and, and, and here um, sliders for the checks. You, you can see them. You can see the openings for the pins, rest, the pins, tuning pins. These uh, results of the of the woodworm uh, had uh, any uh, major influence of, for the structure of the instrument. We couldn't just leave it as it was. Here you see the third stop. We have two uh, two normal stops. We start working with two. Things and the third uh, stop, the loop stop, you could, you could hear in the second musical exam example. The loop, the loop stop is not so bright, it's but the uh, result is a perspective. Keyboard, you see. The keyboard is quite quite uh, has a quite quite big range. The last of the absolute sound to has already its the largest range. It's uh, coming from F to A, as you can see. That means six, five of cast and a fourth. The key. The key levels, the, key, the keys are running on a keyboard frame, which we can see here, with the original uh, clothes 
serving for a dampers for the movement of the keys. Here you can see the new checks, a better perspective of the loop stop, and the new strings already inserted. For strings, get um, went back to materials which are corresponding to, to the original material uh, materials, original strings, I have strings coming from India. Canada, Canada, Canada. Okay, sorry, I'm listening. <laughs> um, so uh, we had only to substitute the supports, the supports, the supports of the instrument, which are not any more original, but copies of pieces of another instrument uh, of the family, and to this family, in that case, from an harpsichord of Joachim uh, José of 1885, with the same um, epoch. So, just to say, uh, I couldn't uh, bother you uh, with more uh, technical details. I think that's enough. And I would give the word to Gerd to say something about his and mine as well, evaluation about uh, all this work we did with the instrument. Yeah, um, just a few words. Um, about the restoration. It is, I think, about four or five years ago when the staff of the museum asked me to um, investigate the instrument to see if it was possible to make a restoration. And indeed, as Gerard already mentioned, the instrument was in rather good condition. It was almost complete, except for the understand uh, the legs and the, the big stick. But um, Almost all the mechanics were there, except for a few dozen objects, maybe. The soundboard was in rather good condition, which has been just a little bit repaired. And um, the keys were also all there. It stuck in the keyboard, of course, because of rust. But it was just a matter of making things going, changing the cross. There was really little work to do. So it was rather a straightforward task. But when I saw the instruments, I I didn't feel quite comfortable because, of course, it's a Portuguese instrument, but interesting uh, from an organological point of view. But musically, I was not so sure because um, there were some nice details on the instrument. For instance, this, this green work, which you see there on the front fashion, is very well done. And um, also, the soundboard looks like reasonable quality wood. Uh, typically, in the Portuguese men, a slab song instead of quarter song, good. But there were other details of this instrument that were not inspiring great confidence. Um, it was well executed in terms of, for instance, the, the joints were well made, but nothing was straight. All the angles are a bit off. Uh, straight face walls should be straight, but they are a bit wobbly. Um, the keyboard, the execution of the keyboard, the details are a bit rude, a bit, sometimes also a bit uh, in the way that they make. So I was not sure that this was going to be an interesting instrument. And as you saw, I had to turn the instrument upside down, take the bottom off. And when I saw the interior with all this scrap wood, and the way the sound will apply, I thought that this was not going to be interesting uh, exercise in musical terms. But lo and behold, once it was done, it was really a very wonderful surprise. I can say with all my heart, this is one of the most beautiful instruments that I have ever seen and played and listened to in my life. Really a wonderful piece of work. The mechanics is very precise, it responds extremely well to uh, what the player wants to do, and the sound, as you could already hear, is also really wonderful. It fits a dark character like the piano, which is corresponding, of course, to this, to this time. Uh, 
the 18th century, late in the 18th century, to bring me in a very, very wonderful photo of the I think um, we have here two, two books. If you want to uh, make a quick consultation of the books, you can do it here. Thank you for your patience. It's quite, quite late. We are finishing this session. Yes, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Just one short uh, announce uh, to the ones who are going to dinner. We have them. Um, the uh, two car seats and those two car seats. Is, uh, if anyone wants to take a ride to the restaurant. I'm sorry, but I'm driving the smart with a uh, lot of material for tomorrow for all the access, so I don't have any car seats for anyone. Uh, but if anyone wants to take uh, a chance with this, if not, we see each other in the Fashfriu restaurant. You should take an Uber or a taxi. It's not.